is the meeting of the Ocean View School District Board of Trustees, and we have about three minutes until we begin. We are now broadcasting via Zoom and via our YouTube channel, the Ocean View School District YouTube channel. So we'll be right back with you. Thank you so much for your patience. There's something there. Okay, good evening. It is now five o'clock and I'm going to call the November 5th, 2020 Special Board of Trustees meeting to order. Okay, we're now at B, which is the roll call. Trustee Briscoe? Present. Trustee Singer? Here. Trustee Souders? Here. And Trustee Westwell is not present. We're now at C, agenda adoption for the special board of trustees meeting for November 5th, 2020. It's for, before us for action. Is there a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. Okay, any discussion? Trustee Briscoe? None. Trustee Singer? None. Trustee Souders? None. And Trustee Westwell is absent. Um, I have nothing to say at this point. The agenda is in proper form, so we'll move to the vote. Trustee Briscoe, how do you vote on the agenda? Aye. Trustee Singer? Aye. Trustee Souders? Aye. And Trustee Westwell is still absent, and I vote yes. Therefore, it passes 4-0 with Trustee Westwell absent. We're now at D, which is our Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise to join us in the pledge. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh. 
Americans or all people in general? For all, for everybody. Even people in other countries? Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Mr. Word. Clerk. <laughs> I want to make sure I'm pledging to the right thing. Yes. Okay. So um, now we are at E, which is public comments. So Mr. Clerk, would you like to read this portion of the agenda for the public? Yes, I will. I don't have any blue cards though at this time, so I don't know where those are, but I think I did see people standing up there. All right, E, public comments. At this time, in accordance with government code section 54954.3A regarding special board meetings, members of the public may comment on the identified items listed on the agenda. Comments shall be limited to three minutes each. In order to address the Board of Trustees, members of the public may choose to do one of the following. Complete an online comment card here at www.ovsd.org slash comment no later than 3 p.m. for comments regarding open session agenda items. Or two, wait outside the boardroom. The address listed at the top of this paper at 4.45 p.m. following social distance markings and wearing a mask until you're invited into the boardroom to make your public comment regarding open session agenda items. That's it. Oh, thank you. Okay, Mr. Clerk, um, how many public in-person comments do we have this evening? Four. Okay, and we have some that were sent in electronically. Is that accurate? Eleven. Okay, great. All right, let's uh, commence with the in-person comments first, please. Call the first speaker. All right, first speaker is Matthew Hoover. Okay, thank you. We'll wait, wait for uh, Mr. Hoover to enter the meeting. Hi there, sir. Good evening. How's Good evening. Are you Mr. Hoover? Yes. Matthew okay, you. Hoover. Yes, Matthew. Uh, thank you for being here this evening. You have three minutes to speak, and we'll let you know when your time is up. But you can look at the clock as well if you'd like. Perfect. All right. Go ahead. All right. Perfect. My name is Matthew Hoover. I'm here tonight on behalf of the community of Huntington Beach and parents throughout Huntington Beach and throughout California. We really want to encourage the opening of the schools completely to get the schools and the kids and the teachers back to regular sessions, back to in-person lectures and in-person teachings and education. Our kids, Madeline Hoover and Kensington Hoover, they have done a really good job with the Zoom and with the changes that have gone on over the last six months to almost a year. And we really encourage everyone here and other people that you might be involved with to bring us back and to free up, especially the parents that are working full time, both parents working full time, trying to make a living, trying to pay their bills. So please, please vote or communicate in favor of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoover. Do the girls have anything to say or want to show us? Come on up, girls, to the podium if you'd like. Come on up. Hi. Hi, girls. Huh? Saw you outside. Glad you're here. You're twins. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Thanks so much. Yeah, if you come up to the podium, we can see a little better. Well, thank oh. you so much for having us. I don't go. Thank you. Oh, Trustee Briscoe has a question. Go ahead, Trustee Briscoe. I have two questions. Are they're, they're twins? Yep. You can say that again, that again? Um, we are twins. <laughs> Oh. oh, that's perfect. Uh, Mr. Hoover, are those the two most perfect twins in the world? You bet. You're very lucky. Thank you for bringing them. Thanks so much, sir. We appreciate that your comment. So nice. Oh, you're nice too. You Wonderful Ocean View students. <laughs> Thanks for coming, Hoover family. We appreciate you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. They had signs. Did you see their I know. Signs? I saw their signs outside. Okay, Mr. Clerk, do we have our next public speaker? Yep, Jessica McKinney. Okay, great. Hi. Hi. Hello, Ms. McKinney. Hi. You have three minutes to address the Board of Trustees. Go ahead when you're ready. Great, thank you. You're, you're welcome. Uh, good evening, Ocean View School Board. 
My name is Jessica McKimmy, and my husband and I have two children, a second and fourth grader at Harborview. They are enrolled in the in-person model of learning, and currently that means they attend in a hybrid setting. I first want to thank you for working diligently to get our kids back to school on campus full time and your tireless effort to provide the best you can for all of our early learners. As I mentioned, our children attend campus in a cohort. While it's great that they walk into campus two days for four hours and 20 minutes each day, they are not being served enough. The three other days that they're home learning asynchronously is failing them. My son is in one of two combo classes at our school, so his time with his teacher while on Wednesday Zoom is cut in half. 30 minutes of time with his teacher is barely enough to take attendance and explain the activity. No learning is taking place then. We are now 41 days into school or into his fourth grade year and he is failing, uh, falling significantly behind in a crucial area of learning. I'm certain that if he had more face-to-face -face instruction, this would not be an issue. I'm able to stay home with our children while my husband works outside of our home, but it is not fair that I'm expected to oversee every small aspect of their school day. Their education is being sacrificed as there is not enough time for my work, their schooling and our home. We do the absolute best we can and I work my hardest to keep everything together, but the system as it currently is, is not thought out and the ramifications are manifesting quickly. Multiple local schools, or excuse me, mo multiple local private schools are back to school full time with full classrooms. There has not been a large COVID outbreak and the schools have remained open since September. Uh, private school education is proving to further, further widen the achievement gap. While we are able to send our kids to private school, my husband and I had faith that public school would best serve our kids' needs. Dr. Hansen recently sent an email stating that there would be a meeting today, November 5th, to reevaluate the plan to get our kids back on campus full time. In the email, she explains that, that transitions take time and that our teachers are comfortable with the way our hybrid model is working. It needs to be stated that there are times in life when transitions need to be quick and burdensome. We will adapt and it will work. On March 13th, we quickly transitioned to crisis schooling. There was no time for a slow methodical transition. Let's do the same with getting back in the classroom now. I'm pleading with you, please get our children back in the classroom full time. Lastly, short of explaining the statistics regarding the COVID-19 crisis, I'm urging you to do whatever it takes to get our kids back on campus full time. Irvine School District and Capital Unified School District have their kids back full time. The teacher meets with half the class for half the day to focus on reading, writing, and math. And the second half of the day, the students are with administrative aides in other classrooms working on social studies, music, art, and PE. How can we make this an option if we choose to continue with the hybrid model? Our teachers are safe, and I trust that you will make the decision on behalf of all the students to get them back in the classroom full time. There's no uh, law in place that requires students be placed in cohorts. Orange County is currently in the governor's red tier, and it is stated that schools may reopen fully for in-person instruction, and that local school officials will decide whether and when that will occur. So the decision is with you, and we trust that you will make the right decision for all of our students. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like Trustee Briscoe has a co uh, question for you. Go ahead, Trustee Briscoe. You reference specific errors and omissions in your son's instruction. Yes. Is it a particular area like math? If there were an option to tutor or focus or specialize, would that be of assistance? The, it, it's in reading and comprehension. Um, and so, yes, of course, a tutor or other supplemental um, help would work. It, I do find that since he is in a combo class and that he has half two different grades, that there are times when there are issues that aren't met for him. Thank you. Thank you so much for your public comments this evening. We appreciate them. Uh, before I turn it over to the, our clerk to give us the name of the next speaker, I do want to state that Trustee Westwell is here and he entered the meeting at 508. Okay, uh, Mr. Clerk, would you like to call on the next public speaker? Next speaker is Brian Leeper. Okay. Hello, Mr. Leeper. Good evening. Good evening. Um, as you know, you have three minutes to make your public comments. You may begin when you're ready. All right. Thank you so much. Good evening, President Clayton Tarvin, Board of Trustees, Dr. Hansen Cabinet. My name is Brian Leeper. I am the Ocean View Teachers Association Bargaining Chair. It's refreshing to be here this evening, not to talk about norms or board policy, but to talk about a lot of the many wonderful things going on around Ocean View School District. Um, starting with seeing the cabinet out and hearing that the cabinet is back out on their coaching Tuesdays, visiting schools, campuses, and classrooms to see what's going on out there. Um, it's amazing to see that our custodial staff, it's probably like Groundhog Day for them. They do a lot of 
cleaning, sanitizing, and rinse lather repeat over and over again. We've got our maintenance people keeping the grounds fantastic, our office clerks running the central nervous system for the schools, and helping out with temperature checks on top of their day job that they do. At three o'clock today, we had a general board or general membership meeting for Ocean View Teachers Association, and we had a conversation about pivoting. And the pivoting component was talking about what the process would look like when and if we needed to discuss the change in hours, work conditions, and things like that. Um, there were a couple of our teachers that were concerned that they saw some of our uh, uh, cabinet and principals on there and they thought we were getting zoom bombed by them but it was basically just letting them know that through the pal process which we have and is operational and functional and functioning well is that for transparency they were invited to attend to see what it was that we were talking about we were talking about making decisions based on data that we would use when we got to the point in time needing to talk about any changes in structure and getting that data through a survey through our membership um, we have done a great job with meeting with our executive council with the cabinet and the bargaining chair. I think some days I see Mr. Avila feel like daily just discuss a wide variety of topics. And I know that Dr. Hansen and Marissa, uh, the OBTA president, are in constant communication as well. Um, the Pell process is meant to be there for when we have easygoing times. And it's also meant to be when you have to resolve issues in other times. And clearly, Ocean View has gone through many challenging trials over the last several years. With 2020, talking about pivoting and changing pace is no different at this point in time. Um, we are confident that through the process that we have with the association and with the district that uh, we will be able to have good conversation with the district when and if the time comes for us to talk about whatever issues that are going to come up that we need to discuss. But uh, the teachers are doing a fantastic job and I know that the cabinet's seen it, whether it be virtual or distance learning. So I'm proud to be part of the Ocean View School District. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Leeper, don't yes. go away so quickly. Oh, Trustee right. Briscoe seems to have a clarifying question for you. What is a Zoom bomb? A Zoom bomb is when somebody uninvited goes into a digital meeting or a virtual meeting and they do things. Um, you know, Dr. Conroy was there and he was quite professional and just <laughs> sat there and didn't do much of anything. And then- uh, Were our principals doing things, whatever that means? Uh, doing things, well, I don't know. Most of them didn't have their cameras on. So if they're doing something <laughs> okay. I couldn't tell. Thank you. If you don't you. know, Trustee Briscoe, you're lucky. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Mr. Leeper. All right, All right so take care now. Our next speaker, Mr. Clerk. Our next speaker is John Salazar. All right. Hello, Mr. Salazar. Good to see you. Good evening again. Good evening. You have three minutes to make your public comments and you can begin when you're ready. Thank you. I'd just like to start by clarifying the school board president's clarifications from my last public comments. Trustee Westwell asked me, and I quote, has the district provided you with any information that masks are effective against COVID-19, end quote. I answered no, because there is no information that supports the school board's policies. They can't find it. Later in the meeting, Gina attempted to correct me by stating, and I quote, in fact, we did share with you recommendations and mandates from the California Department of Public Health, sir, about masks. We did share those with you, end quote. Yes, she did. She shared with me mandates. She shared with me recommendations. She did not share with me any scientific evidence, any factual information that supports the school board policies. I have asked her, and she cannot, she will not, because there is no information that supports the school board policy. At the meeting I had with the school board, at the meeting I had with the school board president and superintendent, I submitted some documents to them. I will read them, I will read to you some of the questions I asked them to answer, of which I have yet to receive a reply. It starts off. As a designated OVSD contact, please explain how requiring masks is legal 
and not a textbook example of unlimited government we teach all students to reject. Because OVSD is supporting the county's health orders, OVSD has a burden of proof to demonstrate how this is within the limits of government power. The questions on the document that I asked them to answer was, what is the authority the county has to demand wearing masks? If that authority comes from the governor's emergency declaration in March, what is the definition of an emergency? How have emergency conditions been demonstrated as real? If required emergency conditions of overrun hospitals never happen, nor need for military field hospitals that were built, nor need for military hospital ships, how do the required conditions for an emergency still exist? Because hospitals have been and are operational, so empty that most laid off staff, that, that doesn't that remove the emergency dict, dictatorial authority? If not, please explain. I am politely, humbly, and professionally asking for OVSD to fulfill their legal, legal obligation to fully explain an, extra, an extraordinary and unique demand on our students. As I cite below, I am demonstrating what OVSD expects all of our children to learn and do. This explanation is especially important and timely given apparent physical and psychological health risks that require everyone to fully color their mouth and nose or risk removal from one's, oh, sorry. If I'm wrong, please talk me down. All the choices you are making are not in the best interests of the children. I am also waiting on a response when I ask you to take the temperatures from the children's wrists and not their foreheads. Okay, your, your time is up. And yes, Dr. Hansen is going to respond to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Trustee Westwell, your question first. Thank you for recognizing me, Mr. Salazar. Do you believe the district is being open and transparent? Not at all. They, 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 have, they, don't, they have not given anybody information except for recommendations and mandates. Do you feel like you're being stonewalled in that regard? At every turn. Thank you, sir. No further questions. Uh, Trustee Briscoe. Uh, two things. I had the same question about why taking a temperature check on the head instead of the arm and wrist. And I received an answer from the superintendent, so I believe she has one for you. And second, you get two shots and bites of the apple. Is Olivia going to say anything? Okay. She, she, she respectfully declines today, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for your public comments. Thank you. All right. Take care now. Mr. Clerk, do we have any other in-person comments this evening? We have no other in-person comments, no. Okay. All right. So now we're going to um, move to the written comments, public comments that were sent in. And our uh, clerk of the board, Trustee Jack Souders, is going to read those now. Go ahead, Mr. Clerk. All right. First one is from Beth Louder. Uh, dear OVSD board and staff, I'm a mother of two girls in OVSD, a seventh grader at Mesa View and a fourth grader at Hope View. I'm a former full-time elementary school teacher and a current OVSD substitute teacher. I write this letter from the perspective of a parent and an educator. My main request is to ask you to allow the students to attend school in person more days a week. If you look at the Fountain Valley District model, their students attend four days a week in two co cohorts one in the morning and one in the afternoon. While the students are on campus for fewer hours a day than in OVSD, they get four days a week at school with live instruction. My youngest daughter was suffering from major anxiety from mid-March when her school closed until the first week she went back to school this fall. She had daily stomach aches, insomnia, and would constantly worry about getting sick or losing loved ones to COVID. Once she returned to school, all of this stopped completely. There is something to be said for the normalcy of being at school even if it is with a mask on and behind plexiglass. The academic, social, and emotional benefits of in-person learning cannot be overstated. The hybrid schedule has been particularly difficult for my seventh grader. She is a GATE student who for the past four years has had straight A's in all of her subjects. This year, she has started off Algebra 1 with a D minus, D and a C minus on her first quizzes and tests. This is not for a lack of effort because she works diligently from 8.15 to 3.30, five days a week. We now have her seeing a tutor once a week for algebra help. She is at a distance 
She is at a distinct disadvantage taking a high school level math course this year, receiving only one fifth of the live instruction as in a typical year. My daughter only gets about one hour a week of in-person instruction from, the algebra, from her algebra teacher and the rest of her teachers. She only gets two days of total instruction, one synchronous and one asynchronous. If this hybrid schedule continues, then she will receive only about two fifths of the content she needs in Algebra 1. This is a foundational math class that is pivotal, pivotal, pivotal for her success in Algebra 2, pre-calculus and calculus. Please consider adding more in-person instruction time for our kids. Their academic, social, and emotional future is at stake here. Sincerely, Beth Louder. Second public comment is from Allison Singy. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. To President Clayton Tarvin and all members of the board, first, I would like to thank you for the thoughtful and well-planned way you, that you open schools in the hybrid model. It enabled children like my older daughter to choose an in-person model despite being high risk for getting seriously ill from COVID-19 due to her physical and medical conditions. I truly value having both my daughters being taught directly by the excellent teachers at their school. That being said, in moving towards further in-person opportunities, I would ask the board to continue their cautious approach before allowing more students, less distancing and not requiring masking. We are heading into the flu season and it will be very difficult to distinguish between COVID-19 and the various seasonal viruses that we will be going around without, that will be going around without an actual COVID-19 test which I'm sure many parents will not want to subject their children to. While I want my children in school as much as possible, I'm hoping it will be done in a safe and thoughtful manner to limit the risk of risk to all students and staff. Thank you, Allison Zini. Next one is from Alana Cooper. Dear Dr. Hansen, President Clayton Tarvin and school board members, my name is Alana Cooper and I am a parent of two children that attend Hopeview Elementary. I would like to start off by thanking you for getting our children back to school in a safe and timely manner. I know this task is, has not been easy, but you have been successful in bringing thousands of children back into the classroom where they belong. Although my, many parents were less than thrilled with the hybrid model, the majority of families stuck by your side and understood the why behind the modified schedule. Now that we are past the initial six week hybrid phase of instruction, I would like to know what the board is planning as far as moving towards our next step of fully bringing all children back to the classroom. My children are in cohort A, leaving them with a total of one hour and 40 minutes of direct instruction over a three day period. This averages to 33 minutes a day with a teacher on those three days. While our teachers are working harder than I have ever seen and are going above and beyond, there is still only such, there's still, still only so much a second and fourth grader can learn in that duration of time. This hybrid schedule has put an indescribable amount of stress, not only on the teachers, but our our students and families as a whole. I am a full-time working parent that many, that like many has had to transition to working at home, schooling my children, being the lunch lady, yard supervisor, cruise director, wife and mom, all at the same time. While we have made it work for the last eight months, I am tired and I cannot do this much longer. I have sat back and watched over 150 families leave Hopeview, many of our, many to our virtual programs, some other to homeschool programs, and a good amount to our local private schools. Every week, it is like we are saying goodbye or hopefully see you next year to a very dear friends of ours and they check their children out of as they check their children out of school. At first, I never considered this an option for my family. We purchased the home we live in so that our kids could attend Hope. We absolutely love our school. However, I too am now considering private school and looking into a variety of options for my boys, which is just heartbreaking for me to admit. As a former public high school administrator, never did I think I would consider private school for my children, but I honestly feel as though I'm being pushed into a corner. I would, I would 100% prefer to send my kids to our kids club program so that they could receive the support they deserve on a daily basis and to be around their peers. However, I'm trying to justify paying $1,400 a month when it would be hundreds of dollars cheaper if I send them to private school where they will receive a full day of education five days a week. For the mental health of our teachers, children, and families, let's please try to find a way to bring these kids back to school full time, even if we need to start considering some outside of the box thinking. Cameras running in the class so the kids aren't comfortable aren't comfortable being back full time can still be engaged at home tents outside that kids can socially distance under splitting one class into two com combining classrooms since many of our schools now have extra space space with low enrollment just some options to think about thank you for your time and consideration alana cooper the next one is from erica manicum manicum uh, good evening, Ocean. Good evening, board members and Dr. Hansen. I'm a kindergarten teacher in our district, and I want to share my current experiences with the hybrid learning model with you. Currently, I have 14 student desks in my room, each with protective plexiglass carol. With this setup, I am only barely able to keep students six feet apart. We have spent weeks learning how to walk within a six-foot distance between us. 
we must walk in two lines because with the safety guidelines of six feet apart, if we walked in one line, it would be 84 feet long. And that is only with 14 students. In the hallway, we must use social distancing spots on both sides of the hall because if we get in one line, it stretches all the way past the main hallway. Staff has worked tirelessly to keep children and adults safe it is, and it is not working. We're having good attendance in person and on Zoom classes. Children are learning. Even my kindergartners are becoming proficient with technology. Kids feel safe at school. The parents in my room feel safe sending their kids to school and I feel safe being here. Tonight, you are considering the possibility of changing from hybrid to full classes. That is absolutely not safe and it is completely unnecessary. Um, or completely unnecessary. There is no reason to endanger the health and lives of children, staff, teachers, and families by ignoring CDC recommendations and packing the class with 27 or more children. Our first responsibility is to keep children and families safe. We all know that children could, can transmit COVID and could bring, can bring it home to their vulnerable relatives. That exact thing happened to a family in my class over the summer. When mom relayed the story to me, she saw that she told me the last time I saw my mom alive was when the ambulance came out to get her from my house. She died alone and I can't get over it. We as a school district do not need to throw out a safe and hybrid program that is working and deny science and CDC recommendations. How can we possibly justify denying science and CDC guidelines when COVID is exploding throughout this country? How can we even consider putting children, teachers and staff in a situation that puts them at risk to contract or bring home a deadly virus? Just like doctors take an oath to do no harm, we should also do no harm. We are heading into flu season. We are very near a vaccine. Districts all around Southern California who are prudent and cautious remain 100% distance learning on a 100% distance learning model. How can we not, how can we even consider being so reckless with the health of children, families, teachers, and staff? The board has a responsibility to ensure the safety of everyone involved before putting them in harm's way, harm's way, especially when a hybrid system is strong and getting better every day. I urge you to decide if your child were part of, if your child were part of the equation, as if you were in the classroom, as, as if your high-risk parent lived in your same house. Thank you, Erica Manicum. Next one is from Ashley Booth, and she writes to the board, district, and school community, thank you for taking so many important necessary steps to keep my second grader and the broader community safe and healthy. Watching her happiness when she is able to go to school is worth all the effort. I urge you to continue to uphold the high level of protection and thoughtfulness as you consider the next phase of our students, of our school's reopening plans. I, like most parents, want my daughter back in school full time. However, I only want it that if it's done with the level of safety and consideration that has been implemented with the hybrid model. Social distancing, mass wearing, and reduced cohorts are working. We've managed to keep the reported district-wide levels very low thanks to these measures. As we move into cold and flu season and holiday season, please do not get fatigued and give into the pressure to lessen these restrictions. Our HB community is holding strong, and I sincerely request that we maintain this throughout the pandemic for the sake of our children, families, and communities as a whole. Lessening restrictions now would be a step backwards as the numbers around the country trend upwards. I urge you to fo keep following scientific data and making these decisions rather than the emotional politicized voices. Keep classes, class numbers low, the masks on, desk classroom shields up, and social distancing as a priority. Thank you for your time. Next one is from Jeanette McNamara, and she writes, Dear OVSD Board of Trustees, Superintendent, and OVSD teachers slash staff, my husband and I thank you for your dedication, thoughtfulness, and unwavering commitment to keeping our children and our community safe during such challenging times. As parents and community members were, we were initially concerned about the daunting tasks and monumental risks associated with reopening for the 2020-2021 school year, but feel the board's multi-tiered reopening concise on-campus procedures and investment in PPE have instilled confidence that OVSD is handling the challenges well under these divisive times. Additionally, as many of you parents with immunocompromised children who recently learned of an on-campus of an on-campus COVID positive case, we feel the notification procedures and community dashboard were transparent and informative for us to make appropriate decisions as a family. As Orange County remains in a substantial tier, I would implore the board to continue their commitment to reliance on the established school safety protocols, including remaining on the hybrid schedule until such times when science and safety allow for more lenient protocols. While we appreciate the importance of our children in school and their scholastic journeys, above all, we value their health and for the health of those we love. Uh, next one is from Michelle Frankly Dizon. Um, everyone has just now settled into a comfortable routine, is not an acceptable, that's in quotes, is not an acceptable reason to keep the current model. This is a time to get comfortable and step up. 
to get uncomfortable and step up. Students and parents are stepping up. We are working to provide for our families, take care of our usual res responsibilities with our children home much, much more, and teach our children at home. It is time for everyone involved to put in the necessary effort for the growth and development of all these children. Based on the current model, what percentage of the regular curriculum can realistically be taught by the end of 2021, 2020, 2021 school year? For example, by November in a typical school year, what modules units would be completed? How is this year measuring up? I'm concerned students are learning at a subpar rate. There is not enough live instruction in person or virtual to cover the full curriculum. Our students are currently receiving approximately 10.67 instructional hours of in-person and Zoom combined each week. This is a small percentage of the instructional hours in a typical school year. This will render our students significantly behind at the close of 2020 2021 school year. This deficit is on top of the loss during spring 2020. This translates into our students starting painfully behind from where they should be come fall 2021. There are public schools in OC offering in-person instruction five days a week. For example, IUSD, why not OVSD? HBSD is in-person with an AMPM model, which allows students to have live instruction four days and virtual Zoom on Wednesdays. This model provides overall more live instructional hours. Why not consider this model to benefit our students? There are virtual systems in existence that to allow students to log in and participate in class in real time. Why not use such, use such systems? HTTPS colon www.swivel.com is one of these systems. Perhaps funds carried over from last year plus current fundraising could make this accessible for our teachers and students. There may also be community sponsors. Students significantly benefit socially, emotionally, and mentally by having daily interactions with their peers and teachers. The in-person relationships are critical. Children have different learning styles. How does the current model reach our ch all children? OVSD is going to lose students. Families who have resources are moving their children to private and charter schools, or they, or they are education for their children. Overall, this will hurt the success of the schools in OVSD. I am confident the OVSD community can and will step up to meet the needs of our children. Next comment is from Vania Pierce. Dear Ocean View School Board, families need the option, families need the option uh, to have their kids go to school full time. Teachers now more than ever are the most essential worker we have in our children's lives, just like how we depend on our nurses, doctors, police, firefighters, and grocery employees. Teachers need to teach in person in their classrooms, just like the rest of our essential heroes. In their placements of employment, virtual classes, oh, in their places of employment, virtual classes for elementary grades are not working. They are not learning. Parents and children, childcare facilities are just pushing our children to finish tasks without any real learning and understanding. This is not a real education at all. The impact teachers have on our children's lives is immense. Lots of kids are losing hope, joy. Children are the unsung heroes of this pandemic and they do not fully comprehend it, but they keep adjusting as much as they can. And us as a society have put them through so much anxiety that it's painful to see the mental and emotional damage this pandemic has caused on our kids. They miss the social interaction they had on a weekly basis with their teachers and peers. Please allow our students to open for full-time in-person learning with the enhanced safety protocols measures, protocol measures, such as mask wearing, hand sanitizing, temperature checks. Six weeks have gone by and we've will probably be followed by another six weeks and another. This is unsustainable. Let's open school safety, safely and cautiously, but open them nevertheless. Sincerely, Vania Pierce, kindergarten and second grade mother. Uh, the next one is from Mark and Kristen Frey. Uh, under the current hybrid model, there's significant loss, learning loss occurring as students are only getting 10.67 hours of in-person Zoom instruction combined each week. If this model is to continue in its current format beyond the original six week transition period, the deficits added to those already incurred last spring will become increasingly difficult to overcome. There is even greater Im negative impact on our younger students who are learning the fundamental skills of reading, writing, and mathematics and are in the current foundational stage of learning. Other schools have gone back to school in person five days a week, such as Irvine Public Schools. Why, can, why can't we do the same? Why is it permissible to have children, child care programs operating on our school campuses from 6.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. for a fee, but we can't have regular school hours. If physical classroom size is an issue, there are a.m. and p.m. models that provide more live instruction daily, such as the one being used by Huntington Beach City School District. And there are also virtual systems that enable students to follow along remotely when they're not physically in the classroom. Such systems could enable more of the curriculum to be covered and reduce duplicate teaching. 
Fundraising efforts could assist in the procurement of these systems where there, where there are shortfalls. For students, parents, and administrators alike, the current hybrid model is not a comfortable routine. This is especially the case for households with dual working parents and, and or those with several children, including our teachers and administrators. Sacrifices are being made across the board to make work in the interim, make it work in the interim, but it is by no means a long-term sustainable solution. Families will have to strongly consider alternative forms of education for their children. Next one is from Tam Glunt. Dear President Clayton Tarvin and members of the board, we are the parents of an elementary school student in OVSD. Thank you for starting in person school with the hybrid schedule currently in effect. With a small cohort size and mass mandate, my child feels safe at school and comfortable attending school in person. The hour my child has of instruction on Zoom during each of the three days she is learning from home are going well, and I think it's important to have her have that hour of live instruction with her teacher on the day she is not physically at school. As the number of daily PCR plus cases for the last two weeks seems to be double what it has been, what it what it was when school started in early September, I do not believe that five days of in-person instruction should begin at this time. Instead, I suggest that the current hybrid schedule be continued through the end of December 2020. That said, should the board be inclined to increase the number of hours that students attend uh, in person for elementary school children, I believe that alternating Wednesdays from 8 a.m. to 12 20 p.m. is preferable to splitting each Wednesdays between two cohorts and extending the duration of the days the students attend school in person. We appreciate everything the board, teachers, and staff of OVSD have done. Thank you, Tam Glenn. And the last comment is from Brianne, no last name. If you tally up the hours for live non parental instruction, it totals 10.67 hours which is roughly 18 hours less than what they were receiving when in person full time. Why are we only receiving one hour of Zoom on Wednesday? Why are in person cohorts only until 1220 and not not 150 for in person days? One of my children sadly seems to be getting less than 10.67 hours as his first grade teacher isn't utilizing the Zoom time to teach, but rather utilizes the time to have students hold up their work to the camera and calls out students that didn't finish by 110. She also calls out students whose work she deems too sloppy. How is that a positive learning environment for mostly six-year-olds? How is that beneficial, especially during a time when their mental, emotional, and social well-being is crucial? I saw many students upset over Zoom by being called out this way. Is it fair to call out a children in front of their peers? No. What about the parents that work full-time and have a hard time finishing by 110? There is no grace period for them. By my own experience, it's very evident that some teachers are tired and frustrated and have not adapted well to the hybrid model nor teaching over Zoom. So when the superintendent says we are just now in a comfortable routine, who is we? Who said this? Teachers definitely aren't. The few I've personally talked to have stated they hate this model. Children are resilient, but not comfortable. They are doing it because they have to. It makes no sense to move forward with more in-person learning. Private schools have waivers with an AMPM option for students. It's working well with zero positive COVID cases. Irvine Public Schools are also going five days a week. Why can't we get a waiver? Do we have the space? There are many options if such a space if a space issue such as the AMPM option, such as the AMPM option, utilizing the NPR as well, it seems, it just seems the ones suffering the most are the students. Studies show in-person time daily helps build relationships among the aged demographic and decreases anxiety and depression. I can guarantee you that, I can guarantee that you will lose students because parents realize students are getting a subpar education with this hybrid model. And those that stay, unfortunately, have to because they don't have the resources. Our children are the future. Let's give them what they deserve. And that concludes public comments. Thank you, Mr. Clerk, for uh, delivering the public comments for those that um, decided to write in this evening. We've heard them. We're now at F, which is reports, F1 school reopening update. And before I turn the meeting over to our superintendent, Dr. Hansen, I'm gonna take a presidential privilege and say a couple things. One is that I have heard, uh, I've heard from several community members that there is some kind of information circulating in the community that there was some intent to go back to fully online instruction. And I just want to say, absolutely incorrect. That is a rumor, it is not true. There is absolutely no truth to it. If anything, we would like to uh, make sure that our students are in school more hours in person, not less. I'll get more into that as we get into the presentation from Dr. Hansen, but I just want to uh, give the community that information and to um, 
gave you the confidence to understand that that is not an intention, uh, at least of me, um, and I don't think of any of the other board members as well, but I'm not gonna speak on their behalf. But I just do wanna say that that is a rumor. And unfortunately, sometimes rumors have legs and they walk all over town. Okay, um, Dr. Hansen, are you ready to begin with the information that you'd like to present to us this evening? Yes. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Hansen. I just need a couple minutes here to, a couple seconds. All right, so good evening, everyone, and hello out there. I know sometimes it's hard to capture uh, the, the essence of uh, information sometimes over Zoom, but we're gonna do our best this evening, and we appreciate all of the people that are Zooming in tonight and checking, checking us out and listening to um, our presentation. And tonight, we are going to do um, a six-week review of our in-person hybrid schedule. So the purpose of tonight's presentation is we're going to share some information uh, on the COVID-19 stats. We're going to provide a review of Ocean View's in-person hybrid model. And we're going to consider uh, recommendations for possible modifications. And I just want to um, share that uh, we appreciate that parents come forward and share uh, their concerns, both positive and things that we can improve. We also hear from uh, staff members and, and we uh, appreciate uh, that you are willing to share your ideas. So uh, we want you to know we hear you and we continue to um, look at all considerations. So as we're making our considerations, we need to really look at safeguarding our student and staff health. Uh, I think you've, you've heard that. Uh, it, it really is a, a delicate uh, balance of, of that health and also what is the best um, possible education for our students. So uh, I, I do want you to uh, know that our um, the status of, of COVID-19 in our community and beyond is rapidly changing. And I think what we all uh, know is that it, there's a lot of information out there. And uh, there's information uh, that some people believe and some people don't. And uh, we're doing our best to provide uh, sci scientific stats for you. So um, in Orange County, um, there, uh, we are what's called the substantial tier. We are in tier two, which does allow us to um, reopen schools. You will see that the seven day average uh, for case rates per 100,000 uh, is rising in Orange County. You can see, you can see that there. And that uh, there is another stat that Orange County looks at, which is the positivity percentage for disproportionately affected communities in Orange County. And um, it had dipped um, and it's kind of stable right now. Uh, another thing that um, you, you may, people ask is when can we go back 100%? Well, the, the um, it, going back to school is, is acceptable in the red category in the red tier. But what you have to remember is there's recommendations for safety uh, and that recommendation at currently is for that six feet of social distancing. Um, also, I want to share that uh, UCI uh, recently did a study and uh, that study uh, is significant in that it strongly suggests that the virus is a lot more contagious and far, far more widespread uh, than case data had indicated. Um, and that, uh, but, but at all the same time, the fatality rate is, is much lower. Some other stats I, I want to um, share with you is that they are creeping up in California. 
um, there is an increase in daily case rate. And as of Sunday, California reported a seven day average um, of a 41% increase. Um, and uh, another interesting fact is that the American Academy of Pediatrics had had announced that at some point they thought that the the percentage of students um, contracting uh, the disease was lower, but it's actually higher. Okay, one second. Her hands raised. Um, okay. No, the, Dr. Hansen, yes. just taking a moment to well, yeah. get, get organized. Uh, the, the other thing uh, that I, I want you to notice, and I think that you we've all heard this, is that uh, the U.S. broke its highest number of coronavirus infections in one day, in, uh, it, and that was over 108,000. Uh, so it's a 21% increase from, from last week. So um, as you can see, the, the, the stats are, are somewhat uh, concerning. And that's what a lot of our um, parents and our staff are, are looking at. So what I'd like to do now is, is talk to you about what we have uh, done uh, as far as preparing for the hybrid model. I really want to acknowledge our staff uh, for the intentional planning. We have safety protocols. We do require masks. Uh, we have uh, temperature taking. We do have uh, desk shields and uh, protective gear for staff and students. We have taken a, a great deal of care in rearranging the classroom desks in space for that six feet of distance. And all staff and students have been trained in our safety protocols before they could return to work. What we see is that um, we are serving students in what's called small cohorts uh, to limit the co-mingling of staff. And that is the recommendation of the California Department of Public Health. And we are following those uh, for instructional time and for recess. Uh, we are following uh, strict cleaning protocols that are consistently followed by our custodial staff. We have about 5,500 students and staff in school and uh, you know we are in a hybrid model, so they're half here. And we've only had seven positive cases, five students and two staff member. And none of those individuals through our uh, contact tracing have uh, actually contracted the disease here in the school district or it has it spread. And I do wanna commend our teachers for increasing their expertise and delivering the asynchronous, the synchronous, and the in-person instruction. So let's talk about considerations for modifications. The current model, a hybrid model, is keeping students safe because we are able to have that small cohort to limit commingling. We're able to manage our safety uh, protocols. Um, the, the thing that I've mentioned previously is the rising numbers of COVID-19 in our state, county, and, and abroad is, is concerning. And, uh, you know, when we've listened to the reports that there's going to be a rise, there was a rise. So we, we need to really think about that. Um, if we do make changes, is that uh, we do need to um, consider additional or new types of training and time for uh, the transition. Because of um, the rise in the COVID numbers, because of uh, the need for social distancing, transitioning to 100% is not recommended at this time. Um, you need to, we all need to be prepared that if we put more students on campus at a time, it's going to stress the system. Uh, there is then going to be the possibility of increased exposure. I truly do believe that the low number of cases, uh, rather the low number of spread, that the lack of spread of the disease is because um, we have the safety protocols in place. 
uh, our classrooms are not large enough to maintain that six feet of social distancing if we brought more students in. And um, more students in the classroom will prohibit us from following the California Department of Public Health recommendations, which is uh, the social distancing and small cohorts. Now, when we have to, I, I, I wanna talk to you about this because it's really important that you understand this. When we have a positive case, if students are not six, if students have been a positive case has been in contact in a classroom and there's been less than six feet of social distancing for more than 15 minutes, then that whole class uh, has the risk of having to quarantine. That hasn't happened in our case because we're able to keep the six feet of distance because our, our teachers and our staff and our students are staying behind their desk carols and they ha we have less number in the classroom. So there's less opportunity for people to be the less than six feet apart. So uh, that's, a, that, that's a good thing in that we haven't had to shut down classes when there's a positive case. Um, other considerations uh, for future modifications. Uh, we, we know that the hybrid schedule uh, is working because we've worked hard at it. Could we enhance it? Could we modify it? Could we make it better? Sure we could. And I think we're open to looking at ways that we could make it better for both staff and students. Uh, our, our key consideration is that we need to keep students and staff safe while addressing their academic, social, and emotional needs. You've heard from people tonight, kids need to be in school more. Um, we need to consider staff concerns for safety. You've heard from some staff tonight from their, their public comments. Uh, we need to consider revisions for safety and cleaning protocols. We need to consider what additional training we'd need uh, what time we'd need to make any kind of transitions. Um, I do think that it's important to explore options of AM PM hybrid schedule versus a split schedule like we have. Uh, that is something that I think we should consider and, and look at the pros and cons of, of that. And uh, so these are some things that we need to consider for the future. So, uh, this is my recommendation of things that we should consider. Uh, at this time, uh, our staff, our cabinet feel that our next step should be to develop potential alternative hybrid schedules to increase opportunities for additional time for students to be on campus and for teachers and students to be together in person and to, of course, collaborate with our employee associations. Uh, keep in mind that uh, any type of changes that we would make would need to be negotiated with our teachers association. You heard from Mr. Leeper tonight uh, that um, we have a good working relationship, but nevertheless, we do have to uh, respect that process to uh, negotiate and to come to an agreement on any kind of change in working conditions or change in schedule. So we would need time, if the board gives us direction to go back and look at some different things, we would need time to, to do that, to collaborate with our employee associations, as well as time to um, inform parents and our, our staff um, of our processes and any changes. So uh, we believe that uh, with your direction tonight to either continue the way, what we're doing or to do, go out and explore some modifications that we could come back to you in December uh, with an update on where we're at with our unions and uh, what, what direction we think we can go in. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Uh, before I go to the discussion phase for the board or debate, um, I want to, <clears throat> Sorry, one moment, please, while I fix my screen. I wanna make a couple comments. So Dr. Hansen, first and foremost, I would like to thank you for your presentation on your recommendations uh, from the staff and, and yourself. And just to let the community know, 
uh, these are recommendations from the superintendent. The board can choose to follow them. We can choose something else. Uh, this is a matter of local authority and local control. We've heard information, uh, statistics. We've heard from our parents. And I think now what we need to do is hear from the board of trustees. Uh, but what I do wanna explain to the board is that as is customary per Robert's rules of order, I'm going to leave my comments as the chair of the meeting till the end so that I don't unduly influence you in any way. And then once I hear from all of you, I think we can come together and potentially discuss what we'd like to do moving forward. Then we'll, I'll ask for uh, consideration and for um, what you think are the best uh, plans of action recommendation. And then I will ask for consensus. We will not have an official vote this evening. There is no action agendized. Um, and uh, that is normal and customary as well. But direction can be given to the superintendent and staff and I intend to be able to get information from the board and then through me, we will give direction. Okay, we will begin with Trustee Briscoe. I have several questions, if the microphone's on. Okay, let's see on page three, no, page two of the presentation. Uh, you used the word fatality, and I've always heard morbidity rates, fatality rates is what you used. What's the difference, Dr. SAT? Uh, are you um, addressing me at this time, Trustee Briscoe or Dr. Hansen? I'm sorry. I always address the chair. Okay, go ahead, Trustee Briscoe. Dr. Your SAT, question? What, what, uh, what is fatality? It says fatality rates is what was used. I've always heard morbidity rates. What's the difference? Uh, I don't think there really is one. I think it's interchangeable, but Dr. Hansen can speak for herself. Dr. Hansen, would you like to address that? Without researching it, I would agree it's interchangeable. So second, I heard from the podium claims of instructional inadequacy. So my question is one, what are we doing for instructional remediation, evaluation, correction, training, intervention? And then second, what are we doing to help students, especially on something as iterative and building like math to have intervention and tutoring to help kids catch up if they're missing something as another speaker alluded to, Doc, um, Madam President. So Trustee Briscoe, I think I hear you asking about what are some kind of supplemental programs that are being used? Is that what you're asking for? Do we have anything to account for a student who's falling behind in math? That's one question. The other question mm -hmm. is, what are we doing to evaluate our instructional performance? Well, and fix um, things like the claim of doing nothing but holding up students' work, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to let one of our staff answer that, but I can tell you that you know, as a classroom teacher, we often check for understanding with our students. Um, I'm not sure what's going on in the classrooms in Ocean View as I don't um, watch the Zoom meetings myself, uh, except for my own third graders meetings I have, I have watched. Um, but your, your first question was about how do we remediate? Is that what you're saying as far as classroom, if children are having issues in class and, and maybe having deficits in learning? What's our staff doing to evaluate our teachers mm -hmm. and how they're performing? Okay, I'm going to ask Dr. Hansen to be able to address this. Dr. Hansen, go ahead. Our, our teachers, for first of all, our principals have access to our teachers' Zooms and they can visit those when they're not in class, but they also are visiting classrooms. I'm visiting classrooms, I see them doing that. They can go into their Google Classrooms and see if they're doing adequate work and they can also see their how their students are doing. So many of our principals actually um, are looking at that kind of work on a regular basis. We do have um, assessment and, and uh, programs such as our iReady and our ST Math program that helps with uh, re remediation. Those are programs that you uh, allocated funds to purchase to support us during this time. So the Madam President, uh, is the superintendent confident that we've done everything we can to identify teachers who might be the 10% low tier teachers who might be a problem and need extra help and work? And are we helping them working with them to get their online hybrid instruction up to par? Yeah, Trustee Briscoe, so that's an ongoing process. Evaluation is an ongoing process and observations by administrators of their 
uh, subordinates, obviously, is something that goes on on a, a regular basis, if not a daily basis. I do also want to say that classroom teachers, I believe, in the Ocean View School District, like those up and down the state, are using small group uh, pullout and these uh, breakout sessions to be able to instruct students that are having uh, difficulties um, during the regular math instruction. So, for instance, Trustee Briscoe, um, something that, that I did just today in, in my online class. So, I gave a math lesson on how to solve um, equations, two-step equations with variables, and there were several students that didn't quite understand, of, of course, because it was like the, the first day learning it. And when I went to later in the day, I, I held a, a small uh, pull out group and worked with those students while my other students were in their breakout rooms uh, discussing other academic matters. So I know that goes on as well. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, it's okay. I, okay. It, it's uh, math would be reading is important. Mm -hmm. Very important, but math is one of those. If a student misses a chunk, it's missing forever, and they'll never get it right on, and they won't do as well in future math cl math classes. So I was hoping we would have some system of tutoring, catch up, intervention. So the next question I had was: I heard the word waiver. What is the status of waiver request? Mm -hmm. Just because you request one doesn't mean you have to use it. Have we looked at the waiver process again since we've looked at it two and a half, three months ago? Well, um, I can tell you my understanding of that, and then I'll let Dr. Hansen uh, weigh in, Trustee Risco. Uh, due to the fact that Orange County is in the red uh, tier, we don't need a waiver anymore. We are allowed to be open per the California Executive Health Orders. A waiver is totally unnecessary. There has been a great deal of confusion in our community um, on this issue, and I just want to reiterate that it is not needed. It is not necessary. Um, we don't need it. We're open. And we just have to make sure that we have a program that is beneficial for, for our students. And we're hearing about information tonight about how to make it better. Okay. So the last question I have is I'd like to understand better what the disease model is for COVID-19. There's some bacteria, bacterium, bacteria, and viruses. If you just come into contact with one or 100, you can develop the disease. They're very, very dangerous, extremely problematic. There's some that you need a million exposure to for 15 minutes to become infected and diseased. And there's some that you need a gazillion for five days and then you might catch it or come into contact, develop symptoms for it. What is the model for COVID-19? And, and I don't know. And so we have everything set up with uh, barriers and corrals and screens and face masks and everything. What is the model for COVID? What's the exposure model that creates an infection versus not? Could you help us understand that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I am obviously not an epidemiologist. I am a classroom teacher, but I do have, <laughs> well, the good news is, is I do have a biology credential and I am a biologist. So I can give you my understanding of, of this information. I, I do know that uh, COVID-19 is quite contagious, in fact. It is. It's um, much more contagious than seasonal flu, and it can be spread uh, through the air. It's aerialized, and that's why there's been considerable talk in the country and by health um, officials about air handling systems and so on. And that's why we have a mask mandate, and that's why we have the corrals. And so uh, I could ask Dr. Hansen to uh, maybe speak more about this, but I can tell you that COVID-19 also being a, a virus, obviously is not alive, it is not a bacteria, it does not have any DNA, it only has RNA. And so um, when it gets out into the air, obviously it has to be ingested or going through some kind of opening in yourself to, to be um, for you to, to catch it. Um, and so how long does it uh, last in the air? Uh, I don't know that anyone has a good answer on that. How long does it last on surfaces? I'm not sure there's clear information on that either, but um, it is quite insidious. It is very infectious. And in fact, um, it's one of the deadlier coronaviruses or the most deadly that has ever been uh, seen or known to mankind at this point. So Dr. Hansen, would you like to discuss or to uh, expand upon anything that I've said? I. I'm not going to be able to expand on what you said, but I want to reinforce that one of the things I reported on was a study that was done by uh, uh, University of California, Irvine, which is a significant study that talks about 
um, it being airborne and that it's it's extraordinarily more contagious than what they initially thought and that it is widespread more than what the cases uh, are indicating. Although maybe the fatality or the morbidity is not as severe as they thought. Nevertheless, people are there, there is a lot of people being infected. Obviously, it's up a significant amount in our country just in this last week. Okay, that Trustee concludes, Grisco? That concludes my questions. Okay, thank you. All right, I, I'd also like to comment there are two speakers outside that like to speak to this item. Okay, um, actually, I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna hear from them right now. So could you please um, let me know who is the next speaker? Okay, just give us a moment. We're going to get them. Thank you. Hello, madam. Go ahead. When you're ready, you have three minutes to be able to address the board. Okay. My, my question to the board is on a Wednesday and a Thursday, if I'm in a cohort A class and I have to have children go to a class that is for 15 minutes per section of the class, how much learning education are you really getting in a 15 minute time frame? Personal experience. I have asked the teacher for a question because my student didn't get an answer because they couldn't figure out the problem. She responded with a slight answer and she said she didn't have time. She didn't have time to finish answering the question. And if we had any other questions she could ask and we can ask in an email. <laughs> that is not enough time to be able to ask the question. You know why they couldn't answer the question? Because she had to get to the next class. That's not enough time. They, these kids need more time to be able to get education in even a, even if it was 40 minutes, a 40 minute classroom, and then a 10 minute extra time for Q and A, that's more sufficient. If your kids go to school before the pandemic, all the way till three o'clock, why are our kids not going to school until that time? Why are we going to school on a Wednesday from 7.45 to 8:45 for one hour so that the rest of the schools can be uh, cleaned okay i understand they have to be clean but where is the education in that manner where is the one to all the way to one o'clock on a wednesday what about a thursday and a friday if you're in a cohort a or vice versa in a cohort b where is the additional time that these kids are going to get for education it's not enough to be given zooms it's not enough. We have to get some other type of uh, some other type of learning available to them. It can't just be on pre-recorded Zoom. I don't understand Common Core. I'm gonna be honest. I don't understand it. So if I don't understand it and my kid doesn't understand it, how am I able to help them? How am I able to teach them? How am I able to help them in that manner? We have to have a better way of being able to have more time for these children, and that's all that I have. So we just need Thank to you. get more time and just 15 minutes and that one hour, it's just not enough. I understand that we have to be closed. I get it. Okay. But we have to understand as well that these children need more time. So we need to expand. I don't know, get have a longer period of time that the teachers need to stay on. They have to stay on until 330 so that these kids can actually get a good 45 minutes per period or whatnot. In my child's elementary school, it was one hour. It was one hour today. And I look at her and the teacher's like, does anybody have any questions? And she had a slight question, but really, could she even comprehend all of the stuff that they were talking about? It's all new and it's all foreign. So thank you. All. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do, okay. Do you go ahead and stay right where you are. I okay. think some of our trustees may have a, a clarifying question for okay. you. Okay. Uh, Trustee Westwell, did you have your hand up? Yeah. You're recognized. My name is Crystal with a K, K-R-Y-S-T-L-E, and my last name is Bevins, B-E-V, 
INS. These are a little tight, sorry. Uh, would you be in favor of returning uh, to a complete in-person model rather than the hybrid? If that's available, of course, if it's available. But if it's not and that we don't have that option and we have to stay on a hybrid model, I, I that's fine as well, but we have to have longer time on a hybrid model. The current situation that we have right now, do you feel that your, your student is falling behind? Yeah. Thank you, no more questions. Anyone else have a question? Um, Ms. Bevins, I, I just wanted to um, ask you, are you aware that Governor Newsom had reduced the, the number of minutes that children have to be schooled within a day? Were you aware of that? No, I'm not. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to discuss it more. If you'd like to watch what we're going to talk about, mm -hmm. you can check the OBSD uh, YouTube okay, great. Uh, feed and you can watch what we're going to talk about. I think we'll be able to maybe answer some of your questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Next speaker. Next speaker is Emily Anderson. Good evening, Ms. Anderson. You have three minutes. Um, while I appreciate you guys letting us come in here to speak, I am blown away and not happy that this meeting started at five o'clock when you know many parents are not even home. So I'm just to say that. Um, it's stated by the OCDE recommendations on July 13th that K-12 children represent the lowest risk cohort for COVID because of the effect social distancing and masking of children is unnecessary, therefore not recommended. Um, yes, my name is Emily Anderson. I'm a parent of two Hope U students. I'm also a teacher myself. I am so sick of this incredibly poor model of education and this time constraint and the emotional damage it's causing children. The amount of instruction time is abhorrent. My daughter is stressed and full of anxiety because of everything is completely rushed. If she apparently cannot even ask questions in class or on Zoom is even more rushed. What I really have issues with is the complete lack of socialization time, which is harming students' mental stability. Secondly, the OC Department of Ed said social distancing was not recommended, nor were masks, but the district apparently overruled the county, not only requiring masks of all children, but even kids with breathing issues, such as my son, who has severe coughing asthma during the colder months and at times coughs so hard he vomits. If he were wearing a mask, he could aspirate on that. Also from the OC Department of Ed meeting on reopening, requiring children to wear masks during school is difficult, if not impossible, to implement, but not based on science. It may even be harmful and not recommended. Further, the policies to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 within schools must be balanced within the known harms to children, adolescents, families, and the community by keeping children at home, which is something many people should do, and hopefully they do, not, which is not what OBSD parents see happening. Also, Dr. Sherry Krupp, former super of Los Al Unified, concluded that in our school's um, closing that we have hurt hundreds of thousands more children than we have helped. Then there's the issue with face masks, something medical personnel are trained and fit tested for yearly. Yet you fail to see how ridiculous this is to expect children to wear these, wear them properly, and expect teachers already limited to an asinine amount of instruction time to harass students if they're not covering their nose or on properly. My daughter's face is, she's 10 years old and she's breaking out now because of these dumb things. Requiring children to wear face coverings may even be harmful to, their, to the child. Learning is inhibited and critical social interactions among students and between student and teacher are fractured. Mandatory masks may well lead to a spike in childhood behavior problems, as well as, I see it myself, they touch them constantly. These encourage kids and cause them to touch as they're always adjusting them. Dr. Alice Quo, president of the SoCal chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, opined, our concern is that recently issued guidelines for schools reopening in Los Angeles County are not realistic or even developmentally appropriate for children. This, this comes down to we're meeting because adults are afraid, not because they're proven, 
not because it's necessary and you're violating my son's IEP and thousands of others. You need to open schools. You've had eight months okay, since schools closed you. in March to do so. Thank you. Miss Anderson, Miss Anderson, Miss Anderson, please approach the podium again. Trustee Westwell has a question. Thank you for recognizing me. You're welcome. Miss mm -hmm. Anderson, thank you for coming down here tonight and letting the board know how you feel about mm -hmm. your child's education. I just want to be clear. Do you feel that your child, your all of your children are being deprived of their Absolutely. education? Absolutely. And you, you disapprove. I'm, I'm hearing you disapprove of the hybrid model and want to go back. Absolutely. I support you 100%. And thank you for coming down and expressing your opinion. If you'd like to hear from my daughter, the student, you can do so if you would allow it. She has the right to speak in public comments if she'd like. You want to speak? All right, go ahead. I go to class and school in a group A, and I always feel anxious and stressed because in class we are rushing to get done. At the start of the week, we do homework and questions about tests, and I don't get my questions answered because we are always rushing. So I don't know, home, know how or what I'm supposed to do. Like questions. At recess, we only get to go on the basketballs, courts, handball, and tetherball, or bars and grouts. Also, I have no friends, so all I do is color or do homework. This makes me feel sad and lonely. I have friends that are in the, that have the same teacher, but are in different groups. The masks are making me have pimples, and the plexiglass is making a glare from the window, so I'm not able to see the board. So, if I want to see the board, I have to stand up. Some things I would like, if you could, is to get rid of the plexiglass or a mask, make recess that, so that everyone could be able to use all of the playground, have more time in school so there's less rush, and have school open every day. Thank you. Thanks for giving us your comments. We really appreciate them. All right, take care. Okay, bye-bye. All right, um, I think we were, well, we heard from Trustee Briscoe and now we're going to go to our next trustee to give comments and, and um, or ask questions. And that would be our uh, vice president. Madam Vice President, you're recognized. I'm interested to see if we have local statistics on COVID, especially our city, not statewide, but local. Do we have any that you could share with us? Madam President? Uh, I don't have them in front of me, but I know that we have them because Dr. Hansen shared them with me this past week. Um, Huntington Beach, I believe, is has the fourth highest number of COVID cases in the county. Uh, at That was the last I saw, but um, I don't know the specific numbers for our zip code. Uh, Dr. Hansen, do you know the numbers for the zip codes here? I don't, I would have to stop and look it up, but okay. it's very easy to find on the um, Orange County Healthcare Agency mm -hmm. has it by zip code. I, I'd like to share them with you. Our okay. city of HB. Oh, has you have it. it? Yep. Oh, okay. Great. Uh, the city of HB has a total, has had a total of 2,600 COVID cases since this has started. Um, the city of Huntington Beach has had a total of 86 deaths since this has started. It has had a total of 157 cases in the city of COVID. The entire Orange County, when you look at the entire Orange County, we've had a total of 679 cases from zero to three years old. Our, I'm specifically more concerned about our age group since obviously we serve them. There have been 985 cases from four-year-olds to nine-year-olds in the entire county. There have been a total of 755 cases from 10-year-olds to 12-year-olds and 668 from 13-year-olds to 14-year-olds. Our current, just when we look at just the county, um, our cases per 100,000 are six. Six. Our positivity rate is 3.6%.
So when I look at this data and very strongly that we have to balance the well-being and the safety of staff, teachers, and our kids. Absolutely. It's always a number one priority for me. I think that it is essential that kids and teachers are safe, that I, I would never compromise the health or safety of them. But when I look at the data, and we, I know that I promise that I would always follow the data and make decisions based on data, it, it also seems that the need is there for kids to be more in class and be more present. Um, so when I look at this data, to me, I am so proud of what we have done from the Ocean View School District. We have some of the most stringent guidelines as far as face coverings, temperature checks, plexiglasses. We, I mean, we've done everything we could to ensure that safeguard of our teachers and our students. So my question is, when I look at this data and the way it's presented, at least to me, it comes across as we're really scared and I am scared. I don't want anyone to get sick. I wanna make sure everybody is safe. But based on the data, I do believe that we could increase our time in class, that we could look at more time in the classroom. When I also look at the data that we were given that in class time, and let me just share with you also as a parent, I have an eighth grade student. My child goes to school Mondays and Tuesdays. She is dropped off at 7.45 and I pick her up at 12.09. She comes home, um, doesn't really do much classwork after that. She checks in on Wednesdays for 30 minutes and that is it. That is all that she is really doing. She does get uh, videos that she can watch and follow and ask questions, but the educational level that my child personally is receiving, in my opinion, could definitely be enhanced. And this is from a parent perspective. Again, I want to balance the data. I want to make sure teachers are safe. I want to balance that the kids are safe. I never want to put anybody in jeopardy, but I also think that we could do better. And I think our kids are lacking more in-class time. They want and need direct instruction from their teachers. There is nothing that could replace the on-face instruction from a teacher. It is so valuable. And our teachers have always been so amazing at that educational level. So I, I just, again, I look at the data and I see this presentation and I understand the balance and these are tough decisions to be made. And I also hear that we're comfortable. I'm not interested in being comfortable. I'm interested in what can we do to do more for our kids? What can we do to ensure that we are growing from where we started? We, we have a great foundation, but it is time to start growing. It is time to, ensure our kids are receiving more in-class direct um, learning. So I, I, I'm really interested in what everybody else has to share, but those are my personal feelings on it. And I, I do look forward to our kids being more in-class time with their teachers. I think it is essential, it's necessary. And I, how do we do that safely? I don't know. And that, I, obviously that's gonna take a lot of work and I look forward to seeing what administration has to offer in that direction. But my feeling on it is kids do need to be more in-class and we do need to do better with in-class instruction and the Wednesday 30 minute hour class time is just not enough, especially for an eighth grader that is getting ready to go to high school. It is not enough. Uh, I'm, I'm really concerned where she will be at the end of the school year. So I urge you guys to please look into this a little bit further and give us some options to what can we do to increase that class time for our kids. Thank you, Madam Vice President. We're now going to go to our clerk. Trustee Souders. Thank you. Um, first of all, mortality and versus fatality. Mortality has to do with the death rate amongst people who are both sick and well. Fatality is the death rate amongst people who are sick. So there is a difference between mortality and fatality. There's this crazy thing you can look it up on. It's called the internet. You can find all kinds of things on there. Um, yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of the hybrid model. I'm kind of wondering though, because I hear a lot of ideas from the board, or I mean, I hear a lot of concerns from the board, but I'm kind of wondering what the direction is that you want to go in. I don't think that the hybrid, hybrid model, let me just give you my example. I'm 100% online with my students. I understand that the community doesn't want that because we have a lot of parents that need to get to work. And we don't think that that's beneficial for the kids. And I agree, it's not the most beneficial situation for the kids. But I see my kids for 40 minutes every day. 
per period, uh, six periods, and I'm with them the entire time. And I have, I can break out into rooms with them and I can do small group work and it enables me to be with them for the full 40 minutes and push out lessons. Um, it's more effective in my opinion than the hybrid model. What I'm hearing from the hybrid model is that if the teachers aren't with the students, the students aren't doing any other work. And since the teachers are only seeing them twice a week, we've got a bunch of kids and pushing out on online lessons where the teachers are not synchronously with them, the students aren't doing any work. I'm not blaming anyone for this. We took our, took our, we gave it our best shot. It doesn't seem to have worked. So I think we need to go back to the drawing board. The other issue is safety. How are we going to address safety? I don't think that it's wise to just go back full time and shove a bunch of kids in a classroom. First of all, I don't think the teachers union would accept that. I don't think that the parents want that. And I don't think it's the safest thing to do per CDC guidelines. But there are other models. I'm confident there are other models we could employ where we would be able to get the kids in the seats more often, even if it meant being you know, online one day a week rather than four days a week um, for cleaning, for high, you know, intense cleaning at the schools or whatever. Um, I don't know, but my bigger concern is that we're talking about reviewing this in December. And I think that, although I don't wanna make a change, a radical change right away, and I understand that we need to negotiate things with the unions and all that stuff, my concern is that's too long to wait personally. I think I think we need to make a decision faster than that. I think we need to come to terms with with the decision that's going to, you know, that, that the teachers union can be happy with, that the parents can be happy with, that meets the health requirements that are required of us um, or that are laid out by the CDC. Um, I think we are losing too many instructional minutes personally uh, in the current model. Um, and I'm not again I'm not blaming anyone. We gave it our best shot. Gave it to college try. That's what you do. If you're in a pandemic try to figure out the best possible situation. I, I just personally feel that it's not working from what I'm hearing from people on the streets. So I'm open to suggestions. Um, my concern is not, I'm not scared of the virus. I don't wear a mask because I'm scared. I wear a mask because I'm concerned about other people around me. I'm a teacher. I've been around viruses for 20 years. I'm practically bulletproof, okay? I don't worry about that. I wear a mask because I'm concerned for other people. We've done the right thing. That's why our numbers are low. People, look around Huntington Beach, people are wearing masks. We've done this, we didn't need mandates, we didn't need laws because we are decent human beings in Huntington Beach and we understand what it means to be concerned for others. So we wear masks for that reason. And that's why our numbers are low. We need to keep them low. We're getting into a difficult time. So far the scientists have been right about everything. They said, if you roll back restrictions in July, you're gonna have a spike in cases. We had a spike in cases. They said, we're gonna get a spike in cases when we start keeping people more indoors in the fall. Now we're having a spike in cases and the numbers are going up. So I'm not saying stop listening to science. I'm saying, let's listen to science and let's find the best possible solution for the kids, the teachers and the parents. And so that we can get as much education as we can possibly get. And that's, I mean, I'm open to suggestions. But that's, I think we need to start from a place where we're all in agreement of, I don't know, how do you feel about the hybrid system? That's what I want to know. Do you feel that it's effective? Do you not feel that it's effective? We've heard a lot from the parents. I'd like to know what you guys are hearing. Um, I've heard from the teachers. And I, from what I'm hearing, they're not finding it to be particularly effective. But they're also not saying, hey, let's just go back and stuff our classes full of students either. So where are we going? And we're the board. We're supposed to give direction. Those are my thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I appreciate your thoughts. Let's now go to Trustee Westwell. Sir, you're recognized. Thank you for recognizing me. Mr. Souders wondered how we feel about the hybrid system. I'm opposed to the hybrid system. I've been opposed to it since day one. I've talked to teachers and I've talked to parents. The majority of both don't like the hybrid system. Parents especially don't like the hybrid system, as we heard from tonight and, and other nights. We're here to educate children, that's what we do. Educate children, that's our primary function is education. And we're failing, we're failing. And you want somebody to blame, to blame the board. We're responsible, you can blame me if you like. 
no matter what we do here in Ocean View, we cannot guarantee the safety of anyone, staff or students. We cannot guarantee their safety. We can't do it. Nobody can. The only thing that we can do is try to mitigate the situation in the best possible way that we can. And I think we've done that. We've successfully done that very well. It's time to get back to school. The whole reason for, for doing this lockdown was to bend the curve, if you remember. To bend the curve so the hospitals would have time to catch up and be able to handle stuff. Well, the hospitals are empty. We handled it. People are going to get sick. You cannot stop it, just like you can't stop the flu or the cold or anything else. You can do things to try to help mitigate it, but you cannot stop it. Let me repeat, you, no one, no one can stop this virus. We have to live with it. We have to. There's no other choice. I'd like to point out some facts. The, the, data, the, the district says repeatedly that we're going to make decisions based on data. But as we've heard from speakers and then others, we're not. The, the district doesn't have any data. We, we've got data that's been presented in this report tonight about the state and the county and, and all over the place, but really Ocean View is all we care about. Now here's some facts that no one's bringing up. If you're under the age of 50 years old, your survivability, if you do catch COVID, is 99.98%. So if you catch it and you're under 50, you're probably going to survive, 99.98%. The mortality rate has dropped significantly from when we first started with this pandemic. It's down 85%. Really, children aren't getting this, but they're being impacted the most. Keeping our kids out of school, which is our primary function, is not in the best interest of students. We are harming students. There's all kinds of side effects from keeping them at home besides just not learning. Suicides rates go up, depression goes up, drug use goes up, alcoholism goes up, um, abuse goes up. But there's a lot of other factors besides just educating them. Keeping them out of school is bad. And the superintendent has mentioned that, that we do things based on scientific facts. Well, I haven't seen not one scientific fact that supports us keeping these children who aren't getting infected. I mean, they're not dying. If they do get infected, they, they heal themselves right away. And uh, the data is just not supporting it. I'm sorry, it's just not there. It hasn't been placed in front of me. I talked with my doctor about testing. The doctor, should I get tested? And he told me no. And I was shocked. And he said, well, why? He said, the testing is only about 50% accurate. He goes, you're wasting your time. He goes, I haven't been tested. He goes, I'll let you know when they come out with a better test. Well, I'm waiting for a better test. When we see these tests going up, 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 it's because we're testing more. People are getting tested, half of them are wrong anyway, but it creates a false sense of uh, anxiousness. And what we should be worried about is how many people are actually dying because it's really, really, really small. The number is really small. It's, I'm sorry that people do die. They do, they die from the flu, they die from the cold, they die from car accidents, they die from a lot of things. We can't stop it. We can't. We have to try to live with this thing the best way we can. Um, I'd like to get back to all of our kids back in school who want to go back to full-time school, back in class on October 16th. I don't think there's any point in wasting any more time. The parents, I'm sorry, November 16th. The, the, the parents want their kids back in school. They're deathly afraid they're losing their education, which, and they can never get it back. Never. Okay. Trustee Westwell, your five minutes has expired. However, um, if the other trustees wish to allow you to speak another five minutes, and if they don't have anything else to say, we'll let you continue on. Uh, I'll go to, uh, it was Trustee Singer, you hadn't expired your next five minutes. Would you like to speak again? 
Okay, we'll come back to you, Trustee West, while you'll get your second five minutes. I just want to add to my comments. I'm not advocating that we return immediately full time back to school. I'm advocating that we increase the live instruction time with our kids in front of their teachers and that we do it in a safe manner, that we do it in a well balanced because the, as important as instruction is, the well being and the safety of our staff, our teachers, and our kids is also as important. So we need to do it in a manner that is safe but we do need to increase live in-person teaching time with our kids. I think that that is essential, that it, there is not enough of that right now. And I don't have the magic answer as to how we can do that where the teachers unions and everybody would be happy, but I, that way is something that I'm really interested in seeing how can we accomplish that and allowing everybody to still be safe and ensure that we are providing more educational time for our kids. I don't think that it would be wise for us to pivot immediately, especially not during the winter months. And as we are experiencing potentially flu season, I do think that we do need to do it in a measured way. And so I do think that it is important that we look at the data, we look at the information, we come back and go, okay, how can we do this in a very meticulous way? Because I think jumping the gun and just doing it can put people at risk. And I think we've done such a good job in keeping the spread low, we don't want to jeopardize those numbers. We don't want to increase those tests. So again, I think we need to do it safely, but we do need to increase that life. So I just wanna make sure that, that that is clear. I am not interested in rushing into anything. The well-being of our staff and teachers and students and families is just as important. So we do, we do need to take the time to figure out what we can do to ensure that is all well balanced. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Um, and before I go to the clerk who had only used five minutes of his time, I do want to just uh, recognize Trustee Briscoe and, the, and let you know, Trustee Briscoe, you had actually done two uh, five minute uh, time periods initially, but it only occurred because you were asking questions and the superintendent and I were answering you. So therefore you could reclaim your time. Would you, do you wish to do that, Trustee Briscoe? No, I really have nothing more to say except the idea that was posited with claims of Capistrano Unified, visions of sugar plum fairies dancing in her head seemed very interesting to me. The alternating in one day, all day at school, part of it basically tutoring and instruction in some other place and then the other half of the class, half the class, half and half, but they're at the school for the full school day with some sort of supervision that complies with state law. Seemed intriguing to me and I hadn't heard that before. That concludes my comments. Okay, thank you. Mr. Clerk, you have another five minutes. You're recognized. Yeah, thank you for recognizing me. I, um, yeah, I mean, without commenting on on the statistics that have been given here that I don't agree with, I I think that um, I do agree with the fact that that my point was that the hybrid model, in my opinion, is not working, and I'd like to spend the remainder of I would like us to direct the staff to spend November looking, working with the, the different people involved, the teachers, parents, um, and coming up with a system that gets our kids in school a little bit more and looking at it from a financial perspective as well. And what can we do as a district to get their, their butts in the seat a little bit for a longer period of time each week? Um, if that means loosening some of the restrictions, okay, but I'm not in favor of, you know, full having the kids come back full time with classrooms loaded with students, I don't think that that's safe. Um, and I think that that violates, well, some of the suggestions that are put forth by the CDC. And I'm, I'm, I've, I like to follow the CDC's recommendations. They've been right so far. So um, that's my advice. My advice is to kind of try to throw this in gear and see what we can come up with before the, uh, before maybe December rather than, than you know, um, pushing it out that far. I, I don't know what the new year holds. I know I realize you may not may or not you may or may not realize that we're actually closer to December than you, <laughs> than you think. We have a Veterans Day next week, then a week off, then we have a week. I mean, then a, a normal week and then we have a week off for Thanksgiving Then we have, I believe, another two weeks, maybe. And then we're into the Christmas season. And so we're already there, really. And the numbers are climbing. So I, I understand that December is not that far away, but I'd like to actually have a maybe a plan in place before we come back and meet in December rather than 
just saying, okay, here's what we've found. What do we do next? Like, I'd like to dedicate some time. I don't mind going to special board meetings and, and talking it over. Like, here's what we found. Here's what we think will work. Here's what we can afford. Let's let's put some put something on the table like this. Um, I think that that would be beneficial. I think, I mean, we're at a half a year now. This is a lot of instruction time lost. We need to get these kids uh, back on track, in my opinion. Uh, we're wasting too much time. So anyways, that's my, those are my thoughts. Okay, I have heard you, I understand. And once we get to hear Trustee Westwell's uh, next set of comments, and then we'll have a, and then I'll make some comments and we can have some further discussion. We'll also hear from the superintendent. Uh, she has more to say to us, but uh, Trustee Westwell, you are recognized. Thank you for recognizing me. I'm hearing that we're not doing enough uh, instructional minutes. That's what I'm hearing. I agree. Our kid, we need to quadruple the number of minutes that we're teaching our kids. And I'd like to do that as soon as possible. I'm encouraged that we want to work on a plan to get our kids back in school. I'd like to do that as soon as possible. Look, if we decide that we want to go to an all in-person model and the parents don't think it's safe for their children, they won't send them to school. It's pretty simple. And they will send their kids to school if they do think it's safe. So I think it's really imperative that we work very closely with our parents and the teachers, but with the parents who pay the bills. That's who we need to be working with to find out which model that they want that they want, the parents, the people who produced these children and send them to school every day. That's what's important to me. I want to satisfy the parents. And from what I hear from the parents, they want their kids in school full time. And so that's what I want to pursue. I'd like us to go back to school on November 16th. I'm hearing the board, they're having a little trouble with the short shortness of that. I think that's 11 days. I think that's more than enough time uh, to get back to school. We've made all these changes in the school. We've got plexiglass. We've got social distancing. We've got masks. We've done a myriad of things to mitigate the situation to be safer. We, we've done all we can. It's time to go back to school. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Westwell. Dr. Hanson, would you like to address the board before I speak? I, I believe that my recommendations at the end of my report of where we need to go is, is what you're speaking about. I think we're pretty close on the same page. Um, I, it, it, I, I do wanna say that is not my recommendation to go back 100% regular school. I do not think that we could keep our students safe, one. And two, I don't think that we could get an agreement um, with staff to do that. And I think that there'd be a lot of parents, although you heard from some parents tonight, we have 5,500 people attending school. You heard from about 25. And not all of them said, bring them back 100%. So let's keep that in, in mind. So it is not my recommendation to come back 100%. It is my, I, I am in agreement that our schedule could be modified. It would still be hybrid, but maybe a different kind of hybrid with more time. Uh, so we have direct instruction with students and teacher and less asynchronous instruction. Uh, but nevertheless, my recommendation is stands is to explore ways to make the hybrid better and to negotiate with our teachers union and bring back. And so if you could give me direction on what you're kind of looking for, then I would have direction on what to work with the teachers union on. And that's what I'm looking for tonight. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Uh, we know uh, exactly what um, you're looking for. Um, obviously, we're holding this meeting to be able to give you direction. And so I want to make a couple um, statements about my understanding of what's going on and explain some of the law in California and where I think we should go. So I'm going to start the timer on myself. I'm going to speak for my first five minutes. And then if I need to extend, 
I will uh, to be in alignment with the other board members. And then we'll have another set of discussion if we need to. I think this is a very important topic. And I will, um, I will suggest that we extend our debate um, and we can take a vote to do that after I finish my, my time period. Before I start, I see a hand up. So I will recognize you, Trustee Westwell. Yes, a point of order, please. Yes. Um, can we run the timer up here so that the entire board can see what the timer is? Well, we can. Um, we haven't done that thus far. I've been keeping track um, on my phone here and I have an, an alarm and it sounds when the five minutes is up, but sure. Yeah, yes. I would appreciate it because I really can't see your your clock over there. You I know you couldn't see it when um, you were speaking as well, but I did give you and I, I gave you five minutes, then another five, as well as every trustee got the same. So, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm unclear. Can we run the timer? I think Mr. Avila can run the timer. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So, um, I, I do want to say uh, that there's considerable concern in the community uh, amongst our parents and the students themselves that uh, they're not um, having enough in class time. I wanna say from firsthand experience, I know about this from my own child. I have a third grade child at Hope View and he's in the B cohort. So he attends school on uh, Thursday and Friday and he has asynchronous learning on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And I know that it's very difficult for him because he's eight years old and it's hard for an eight year old to be self-directed Obviously, I am a classroom teacher, so I try to give my child the attention that I would want to. Uh, but unfortunately, I am teaching my own class all online for five hours and 20 minutes a day from Huntington Beach to Cerritos. And let me tell you, it isn't pleasant. I sit for five hours and 20 minutes a day with my students with a couple short breaks. Um, it, it is, it's literally bone crushing and I am not exaggerating. My bones are getting crushed. So I'm unable to attend to my own child. I also have a 10th grader who went through the Ocean View School District. He's now at the Ocean View High School and he is all um, virtual because unfortunately the Ocean View, sorry, the um, Huntington Beach Union High School District had a dilemma and couldn't get their um, plan together and hardly any of their teachers have come back. Apparently in some children's day, they only see one teacher or no teachers. And I, got, I guess there are aides and substitutes in the classrooms and there are about eight kids in each class. My child decided not to go back because they have no plexiglass. And he said, a lot of kids would misbehave and wouldn't wear their masks, unfortunately. So you know what, we're all in this together. It's all, it's all hard and it's all not good it's all uh, stressful and I just want to let the community know that I feel your stress and I understand it. It's not good. My child has also come home and told me that uh, he has in his little cohort, half the class, he doesn't have any of his really good friends. I heard another child, I think it was Miss Anderson's child say that she doesn't have any of her friends in the, in the group and because they're segregated, she doesn't have friends. And my child said something sort of similar, although he has a couple friends. He's, what I mean is he separated from his normal friend group because of the way that we have the cohorts. He also explained that, that recess is very short and um, apparently they have to eat their snack and have recess all in a 20 minute block. This is actually unacceptable to me. As a classroom teacher, that's unacceptable. I would not uh, have my students doing that. They should be eating a snack at a separate time and they should be having a full 20 minutes recess. Unacceptable. Okay, um, but I do wanna say that I don't think it's safe for the, ki the kids to be back 100%. We would not even be able to have two feet of separation, maybe not even one foot of separation uh, in the classrooms because they are so small in square footage. Dr. Hansen made a comment about the fact that if we had a, co a COVID case, we would have to shut down the class uh, because of the fact that is a, a great possibility because we have less than the six feet separation. I want everyone to understand that. When you have less than six, six feet separation, you then would have to go into a different model of when you have a positive or a hot case of, of COVID in the classroom. Um, and I'll come back to Dr. Hansen in a minute to be able to clarify that, but I don't wanna see classrooms shut down. 
We haven't had to do that thus far, and I think that would be very damaging to our students and our staff. I also want to say that I think this hybrid model and this configuration is not working. Um, I was never a fan of it, but it was something that I felt like we needed to do to get our teachers to come back. Um, every teacher's union is different, and I want to make something very clear also about teachers' unions and what they are there for. The number one ob uh, objective for a teacher's union is to protect their students, not just their own safety, but their students. Um, our special interest are the kids. So I believe that the Ocean View School District Teachers Association cares deeply about their students, not just themselves, which I've seen a lot of rumors and innuendo thrown around saying it's just about unions. No, it's not. Unions not only protect the adults, they protect the children. Teachers are in parentis loco. That means that when the children enter our classrooms, they become our legal children. I take this very seriously. When your child enters my classroom, they are mine. And I know that all of the teachers in the Ocean View School District feel the same. We will not allow our students to be sickened. Mr. Avila, please load another five minutes on the clock. Thank you. So, and that's per the California Ed Code. Teachers are legally responsible for their students as parents the minute they enter either our online class or in person. Can we do better? Absolutely. Do I want us to do better? Absolutely. Is this acceptable to me in this cohort configuration and this hybrid configuration? No, it is not. And I wanna say that not all teachers unions believe that uh, this hybrid situation is, is, is good. The one that I belong to has said all along that it was going to diminish uh, in-class or in-person instruction and these instructional minutes. So not all teachers unions are created equally, by the way. Um, I wanna say though, that the teachers union is made up 100% by the teachers. When people talk about unions versus the employees, that is faulty. That is false to do that because 100% of the teachers are the union. Please, community, understand that. We cannot unilaterally force the teachers to come back full time. That is something we cannot do. Not just a moral obligation not to do it, it's also a legal obligation. We must have collective bargaining with the teachers union. If they choose to say no, it's no. I think what we know what would come next, and I'm not talking about in Ocean View, I'm talking about just across the country. Employees have rights and they have to negotiate with the district. No matter what the board says, they have to agree to the plan that we would like to institute. That is the only way. I know some of you may be listening don't want to hear that or you can't accept it, but this is the reality. And as many of you know, I'm very straightforward and I don't want to lie to you. So while the board may have certain intentions, the teachers have to agree to them. And also the other classified staff have to agree to them as well. So here's my recommendation. And I hope that the, the board will weigh in. I think that we need to have kids back at school, possibly every day, but maybe half days or four days a week at half days. That could be something that potentially could work. Um, I know there are other districts that are doing that. Some of them have their kids less minutes, but more days. Some have um, more days with less minutes and so on, or more vice versa. But just knowing that the governor has put these uh, minute restrictions on us, uh, we know that there are less minutes required than normally. Normally a teacher's day at elementary school is 300 minutes mandated. Now it's down to 240. So we'd have to, to negotiate to go above that. I just want the public to really understand this. The governor has made these changes. So therefore we'd have to negotiate with our teachers to go above that. I do think that it's possible. I do think that our teachers of the Ocean View School District are excellent. I think they have always wanted to go above and beyond. They are the best. They have always been the best and I believe in them. I believe we can work with them. I believe that we've always had great labor relations with them for a couple of reasons. Um, and some of the reasons are actually right here at our dais and sitting out in, the, in, in our staff, sitting right here you know, in our boardroom. 
it's because relationships do matter. So do I want our kids to come back to school more time? Absolutely. Is it going to be 100% at this time? I don't think that's possible because our superintendent has told us that is not her recommendation, nor would the teachers agree to it. Until she goes into a collective bargaining with them, um, we won't know the answers to these things. My thought is to have the kids back more time on campus, have them there, even possibly five days a week, but done in some other kind of configuration. I will leave that up to the staff to decide what is best to do and then come back. Uh, Mr. Clerk, I agree with you that December is too far away. I think I've made myself known to some of our staff, my positions known, I should say. I think it's, it's too long. I think we need to come back with an answer sooner for our, our community. I really believe that. And again, I always aim to tell you the truth and to, to push what's uh, best for our students. So it looks like I have 30 seconds, um, but I'm going to ask the board to consider these things. Consider uh, that the fact that we could give the superintendent direction to go back and come to work with the teachers association and our classified association to be able to come back with a better model um, uh, to have our students on campus more, possibly even five days a week if it's possible but with a, maybe a split schedule and work to have the kids in front of their teachers more hours. Okay, so my official time is up. I think what I would like to do is ask if there's a motion to extend debate time. Is there a motion to extend debate? I move to extend debate time. Okay, uh, discussion on extending of debate. Trustee Briscoe, anything to say? None. Uh, Trustee Singer. Trustee Souders? No, no. Trustee Westwell? Yeah, I just have a point of order. Sure. You're talking about the uh, special rule that we made to limit the time to two five minute segments. And Madam President, that rule is for debate, and we're not in debate. This is not an action item, so we are not in debate. This is just a report. We can freely talk about it because the five minute rule for debate is not a problem. Thank you. Well, thank you for your interpretation, sir. I do not concur. We will continue on with the motion in a second. The motion at hand is to extend. And um, it's because of the fact that I'd like to have continuity. And my uh, the motion from Trustee Briscoe will carry on. So, Trustee Briscoe, how do you vote? I will, we already did discussion. How would you like to vote on extending the date? Right. Trustee Singer? Trustee Souders. Aye. Trustee Westwell? No. You don't want to extend debate? No, I've heard enough. I'm ready to uh, open our schools back on November 16th. Oh, okay. Well, I'd like to extend debate, so I'm going to vote aye. And so it passes four to one. Trustee Westwell voted no on extending debate. He doesn't want to talk about this anymore. Okay. Um, but the ayes have it, and therefore we're going to continue on with our discussion. So. Um, Dr. Hansen, I'd like to go back to you and I'd like to ask you, what do you think our next steps can be now that you understand that we have um, a, a desire to have the kids back in school more, more days? I think you've heard there's a consensus of the board uh, to be able to do that. Dr. Hansen? I shared with the board um, copies uh, of the neighboring district's schedules that are also in a hybrid. The reason that many districts are going in a hybrid is is a variety of reasons and let me and it's the same of what we're doing so let's review what it is it's to have small cohorts all right it's also to a, allow for a cleaning in between in between those those cohorts because we can't get um a full class inside our class and keep the six feet of distance if if you're going to see students every single day we most likely are not going to be able to see them the same number of hours that we see them now. Because there's not enough hours in the day that teachers are contracted to work. So teachers are contracted to work a seven and a half hour day. So we, they also need time for planning and we need time for cleaning. So if you look at some of the neighboring district schedules, you'll see that uh, it's that students are, are going to, if we make a modification to a schedule, Students possibly could come to school four or five days a week, 
which would overall increase the number of hours that they're in school and increase the number of hours they're getting direct instruction. But it would not be more hours a day than they're having right now. That would be that that would be very difficult to pull off. So I'm just I'm being transparent here. Uh, the other uh, the other thing that I, I I want to make sure you understand the 240 minutes is not 240 minutes of live instruction. It's 240 minutes of school, which could be live instruction in person. It could be over Zoom or it can be um, asynchronous where the teacher assigns work, which they do now on the day that the student is not in person cohort. So that is the new regulation. It's not live in person 240 minutes a day. It's 240 minutes of instruction, which can be live in person synchronous, which is over the screen, the teacher are teaching, which is what uh, Mrs. Clayton Tarvin does, President Clayton Tarvin does, or asynchronous where the teacher pushes out work through a, what we call a Google Classroom. So just to be clear, we are meeting those minutes now. Actually, we are exceeding those minutes now. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Yes, um, in fact, we are, but that doesn't preclude us for having, from having 240 instructional live minutes. Just because the governor says that they can be made up of three doesn't mean they have to be all three or even two. It doesn't mean that we have to have asynchronous and synchronous on Zoom. It doesn't mean that we have to have some live in person and some Zoom. It can mean that you can do them live. Um, so we have to think of a way to be able to increase them um, and, and make sure that our teachers are comfortable with, with doing that. Uh, but just because you can do something doesn't mean you have to do something. Um, I believe that it's always best to be with your students in person. I would go back right now to my classroom in LA County. I would go. I have joked with Trustee Briscoe, I think, and Trustee Singer on. I said at one point, I'd, you know, I'd put on some kind of you know, hazmat suit to go back to work. I joke, of course. But of course, we wear PPE to protect ourselves. The point is that I think... Uh, that at some point, online learning, yes, we have to do it. Is it the best thing? No, it's, it's, quite, it's quite difficult. So, Dr. Hansen, I think we're going to have to leave it in your hands to come back and tell us what you could potentially do, with Mr. Avila obviously being our chief negotiator uh, for the district and what he can do with the chief negotiator who we heard from at the microphone today, uh, Mr. Brian Leeper, and work with the association to come back with a, a better system for our kids. That's my recommendation. And I'd like to do that sooner than later. I don't wanna drag this on. I think we need to get the show on the road. Trustee Briscoe, do you concur? Yes. Trustee Singer? Trustee Souders? Yes, ma'am. Trustee Westwell? I have some questions. Go ahead, Trustee Westwell. My questions are for the superintendent. Is the superintendent able to guarantee the safety of all students and all staff? Dr. Hansen, uh, can you tell us what are the uh, legal obligations in, in making some a statement about that what are the liabilities of the school district in general as far as safety while on campus? Let me restate my question again. Can the superintendent guarantee the safety of all the students and all of the staff? That's my question. I can guarantee that our staff is doing their due diligence in putting systems in place to ensure that there is safety in our schools. Accidents sometimes happen. Okay, so I'm hearing you cannot guarantee the safety. And I, I think we both agree that the staff are doing a superb job of mitigating the COVID problem. I, I think, I think you're asking a somewhat a impossible question to answer. That's what I think you're doing. Okay, well, I think it is an impossible, probably an impossible question because I don't think you can guarantee the safety of the staff and the students. I don't think you can, and I don't think you want to answer that question. I don't think you can. 
It's impossible. I can't do it. The doctors can't do it. The president can't do it. Nobody can do it. So it's foolish to think that we're going to start. Okay, let's recall our decorum. We have rules of decorum. Please follow them. Totally decorum. I'm telling you my, my mind. Here. I understand that, but you sound argumentative. If we were in court, that's what the judge would say to you. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way, but I'm telling you my feelings. I understand and if, that. And if you're upset by them, then that is your issue. Point of order, sir. Rules of decorum. Please continue on with what, your questioning what, of the superintendent. Which rules of decorum am I violating? You're being argumentative. Can you just please get back to your I'm questions? Trying, Madam President, I'm trying to get a straight answer from our superintendent who we pay a quarter of a million dollars. I'm just trying to get an answer, that's all. She's given you an answer, move on, sir. And I am, I'm, I'm speaking to that and we have interrupted you. So I please recall, I'm just one more time, the answer that I heard from the superintendent was that she cannot guarantee the patient she did not say that, sir. She said that, something that was else. My understanding is what I heard. Carry on. If you disagree with what I heard, that's your opinion. Please stop interrupting me. It's harassment. Point of order. It's Carry true. on, sir, with your questions. You're extinguishing my speech, Madam President, and I'm offended by that. And it's not in your role. I have an equal opportunity to speak just like you do. So please stop interrupting me and harassing me. You made this into a hostile work environment here. The last question that I have for the superintendent. It's my understanding that before COVID started, we had a labor contract with both of our labor uh, associations. Is that accurate? Yes. And do we still maintain that, those labor contracts or have we ended them? We have not ended those, but we have made uh, modifications in that you approved, the board approved, a memorandum of understanding of how we're operating during the pandemic. I, don't, I believe I didn't vote for that. I think I, think I voted against that. I'd have to go back. But we are a collective board, and so the board majority I did approve that. I believe I voted against that. So. And if we went back to the all in-person model, just like we did before COVID, wouldn't they be under their same labor contracts? No, because we've agreed to this memorandum of understanding during the pandemic, during the certain uh, executive orders that are in place and the California Department of Public Health recommendations. Those were pretty unfortunate decisions that this board made and will probably live to regret it. But uh, I disagree with, with how you, uh, you find this and we'll just have to agree to disagree. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Trustee Westwell. Um, and I do want to say that um, I, I disagree with your characterization of me calling you back to order as harassment. It is not. We need to keep levels of decorum so that we can have an orderly and kind board meeting. Okay. Uh, let's see. So that was uh, Trustee Westwell's five minutes. And I'm going to. Law and order, folks, law and order. And part of the law and order in the state of California is that we follow labor law. And the teachers have a contract and we have a memorandum of understanding to work during the pandemic. The governor has allowed for this under his executive orders. And this is what we must do. This is not a choice. We must do this. 
Um, I am getting a message from a community member that they cannot hear us. I'm not sure what that means. We're fine. Okay. All right. Um, so, Dr. Hansen, um, I think that I have heard from all the different board members. And I think what we'd like for you to do is go back and talk with our labor groups about uh, increasing the in-person time with our students on campus. And this is, of course, working towards getting kids back full time when it is safe to do so. That is an intention of mine. I would like to see that as soon as we can. But as of right now, um, it is not recommended uh, by the Orange County Healthcare Agency or by the state of California or by the CDC. It would put everybody into a situation that could potentially lead to spread and outbreak of COVID, especially leading into this uh, flu and COVID uptick season. So I'd like to see that happen as soon as possible. I just don't think it can happen in this month or next month. And so we're gonna need for you to be able to come back to us with um, your expert opinion and your information that you have gathered from the teachers and the staff. And um, I think that's really it. We just want to see more. If I could leave off with one closing statement, it would be the community um, is looking for more instructional time for their children at school. Yes, Dr. Hanson, would you like to speak? Yeah, I, did, I need some clarification. Yes. So is your, is your priority to come back more days or more hours in one day? More days, Dr. Hansen. Okay, thank you for that clarity. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing is, uh, I, I, I think I'm unclear about December 15th. We have one board meeting in November, which is November 17th, which is, you know, only 12 days away. I do not think I'm gonna have anything agreed upon or even uh, draft to bring you then. So the next board meeting is December 15th. Uh, are you saying that you want another meeting, a special meeting before December 15th, uh, which could be the week before, or do you wanna wait till December 15th? Um, what I'm saying, I believe, and I heard Mr. Clerk say something similar about what I'm going to, to say, but you could chime in when you're ready, Mr. Clerk. I would like, um, and first of all, I have a question for you, Dr. Hansen. Why do you think you couldn't have anything for us at the next board meeting? I want you to clarify that just for the community to hear of why. Uh, you, why there, you it takes time to schedule time with teachers because they are teaching and uh, and they are the teachers that are teaching. So we have to pull them away and find time uh, to meet and confer. And uh, then they need time to run things by their people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't think I could get a lot of quality work done in that many days. Okay. And there's a holiday in there. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're only talking about, um, we're talking about uh, one, five, six, seven days. Okay. And I ask that because I want the community to know why uh, yeah, it can't be done. That's seven days that we have that, that means tomorrow I'd have to start scheduling that and try to get those you know, people and they'd have to find substitutes or things so they could teach their own class so they can come and meet with us. So um, negotiations is, is very time consuming. Yes, I understand. Okay. Um, all right. Oh, and so, also there's parent conferences going on. Yes. So those, you know, those teachers are kind of booked up. Okay. I understand that. Definitely. I just finished up my parent conferences and it was, uh, it's quite time consuming and it's all online. So it. uh, it's very demanding and we need to meet with all our parents. So Dr. Hansen, um, I am not, um, I'm not interested in waiting till December 15th. Also, that's the meeting where we would reorganize just for the community's um, um, a point of information for the community. We reorganize our board leadership in December. Uh, we're gonna do that on December 15th. That means we'll choose a new president um, and a new vice president and a new clerk. Uh, we do that yearly or almost yearly, depending on how the, the board feels. And this year we're going to have an election and we'll um, have a new president so that uh, we can have our a new um, leader 
sitting here. But my point in saying that is that I would like to make sure that I, as the president currently, um, make sure that we have another meeting scheduled before we get to that December 15th. So I would like to work with you, Dr. Hansen, uh, to have a special board meeting um, to be able to discuss this. And I want to ask Mr. Clerk, was that something that you were um, wanting to do as well? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think I would, I would hope, and I think that this is the desire of all of the teachers that are out there that this would be a priority. I mean, we want to, we want to take care of this problem as quickly as possible. Our students are missing instructional time. Um, it's not an effective system. I think that there's somewhat of a consensus out there as to that regard. And I would encourage everyone involved to just really think outside the box and to avoid complaining and come up with solutions instead. Um, and to bend a little bit because we're gonna have to compromise to meet the needs of the students. And this is not a permanent situation. It's a temporary situation, hopefully, while we're under these strains. Um, but I think it's necessary that we come together at this time. And this is, you know, we've done this in the past. I mean, not under viral conditions, but we've come together and made things work. And our, you know, we have a huge brain trust out there. Every single one of our teachers is educated to the max. These are people that have been in the profession for years and years and years. They know how to educate children. They know what works and they have good ideas and they can get together and they can collaborate and work with the district. And I think we can come up with a solution. I'm confident we can come up with a solution. I know we can, because that's how we, that's how we do an ocean, ocean view. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, it's a priority in my mind. So I don't mind having special board meetings. I'll come back, you know, I'm good. Okay. I'm just in my teaching out of my little cave in my garage anyway, so actually gets me out of the house. So, Okay, thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, Dr. Hansen, I think that you would like to uh, address the board. Well, um, can I just make a recommendation since sure. we're all here? Absolutely. Um, you know, whatever information I have, I can share with you on November 17th. Uh, but I don't think I will have a definite um, recommendation or sample schedule, or I may have sample schedules. I don't know, but I cannot make any kind of plan by November 17th. Well, we and, understand that. Yeah, I think what we're talking about, uh, because that's only, that's less than two weeks away yeah. and the teachers yeah. have conferences and right. that's just, uh, it's too much. So, And then the following week after November, the week of November 17th is Thanksgiving break. Mm -hmm. So um, I would recommend that we either have a special board meeting on Thursday, December 3rd, or um, Tuesday, December 8th. Okay, well, since you and I work to put those meetings together, I would actually, I think that I would choose the third. That's where I would go. Um, yes, and I forgot about Thanksgiving. Oh, gosh, everything's just so upside down. We're, we can't even remember where we are or what week it is. Okay, so on the 17th, you're going to come and back our, to us. And our, and our schools Dr. are Hansen. closed the whole week of Thanksgiving. To I just understand re that. Re review. I understand that. Hold on, Dr. Hansen. I was saying to you that you're going to, you could be able to come back to us on the 17th at our regular board meeting with information, uh, some kind of update. Is that accurate? Our progress. Okay, your progress. And then after that, we can actually have a special board meeting on December 3rd. Yes, and that gives us a chance that if we need more information, we could, would, we could then bring it back on the 15th. Oh, okay, all right. And so, um, yes, Trustee Souders, go ahead. Just really quickly for clarification, um, just for the public and for the board, because I think part of the board meeting that we were having was, was to re-examine, we had given the public a date originally that we would be re-examining hybrid and whether or not we're going back to school full time. And we are saying as a board that we are not. So I just wanna make that clear to the public that we are exploring other options, not other than going back full time with packed classes full of students, correct? Well, partially correct. What we originally said to the community was that we would have a re-evaluation in six weeks we did not say we would reevaluate to come back full time. Right. But we did say we would reevaluate to take that into consideration if the numbers looked like it would, uh, that we could do that per the numbers. What I think I'm hearing the board or the majority of the board say is that we are going to ask the superintendent to go back and talk to the teachers and staff and classified staff about being 
with the kids more time, possibly more days is what I'm looking for, more days uh, so that the kids can be back on campus and in front of their teachers more hours in a day, possibly looking at like an AM PM type of schedule and not full time because we cannot maintain the six feet of distance. We couldn't even maintain a two feet of distance and that will throw us into a new set of problems, which are if we have a child come down with COVID, the whole class has to be quarantined. Uh, Dr. Hansen- po Possibly, possibly. Okay. Possibly. But Dr. Hansen, what does that possibly mean? Tell us what it means. Well, if there's a high number of students, if you have less of six feet of, of distance, then there is a chance that more students are exposed. So then more students within the class would have to quarantine. So if you have 12 of, of the 16 students that have to quarantine or even 10 of the 16 students that have to quarantine, it would probably behoove the class to go back to distance learning for that period of time. Mm -hmm. And that's stipulated under the health order. Yes. And yeah. that, that is not a recommendation. That's an order. Is that correct, Dr. It, Hansen? It, it is the guidance that we get from the health healthcare agency. Yes, it's an order from the Orange County Healthcare Agency of who we tell to quarantine. So it's, it's driven by the healthcare officer. Yes. Okay. But let's be clear. Mm -hmm. It may not be that all of the students had to quarantine, but you're a teacher. If you have 10 of your 16 <clears throat> kids that have to stay at home, wouldn't it be better to teach them all from home? I mean, yes, I believe so. Right. So it could, it does have the potential. Okay. I understand. Okay. Uh, Mr. Clerk. Just one more thing, just so we're clear and the public's clear. So we are not switching from our current model at this time. We will continue with the current hybrid model until we've worked out the details for a new one. I, I think it would, it's my recommendation that we tell the public that we're staying in this current model through uh, until the board makes a decision, but at least through uh, winter break. And that's what I want to clarify. I, I, because even if we make a decision on December 3rd, it's going to take us time to make those changes. Mr. Clerk, yeah. the answer is going to have to be yes, because legally it has to be yes. We don't have an agreement with the teachers to come back full time. This is the reality. I, I just really want the public to hear this very clearly. And thank, thank you, you, Mr. Clerk, mm -hmm. for <laughs> forcing the clarity. Thank you. And, and even even about changing the schedule would take negotiations. I, I understand that, Dr. Hansen. Yes. No, just I know you do, President Clayton Darvin. I just want to make sure the public un understands that. Right. Thank you. Yes, Madam Vice President. What we're saying is we would have these meetings, see what the teachers unions are willing to work with us on, bring those possibilities back, then potentially pivot after negotiations have been completed in the coming new year after winter break is over and sometime i'm not going to put a specific date but that's the potential what we're looking at correct correct and i think with the good communication as the parents the current schedule will stand through winter break and then af after that we'll give you further notice i i think that i am also in agreement that these conversations and the special meeting it is necessary because by then we would be able to work out these details so that when we do come back we're ready to go instead of wasting time figuring out and then scheduling something so I think the special board meeting will be essential for us to make those decisions so, so Dr. Hansen what you're saying is there's no possible way for the kids to come back in a di different uh, configuration anytime before the Christmas or sorry holiday break that is yes so it cannot happen. Is that accurate, Dr. Hansen? I would find I would find it extremely difficult to finish negotiations, get it approved, and make changes in our format and communicate to everyone and make that happen any earlier than January. Is, it, is, impo is it impossible, Dr. Hansen? It's virtually. I, I'm going to tell you, it was probably impossible for me. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. I appreciate your honesty. Uh, I think that the community really needs to hear what the reality of the situation is. Because I think what happens a lot of times is they hear uh, things, and I talked about earlier about how um, rumors have legs and they walk all over town. 
and uh, sometimes information or misinformation, I should say, gets out and they believe some of the community, and I, I understand why. Uh, it's difficult to understand how collective governance goes and how collective bargaining goes. But the reality is, is that um, I, I might say I want a certain thing, but there's no unilateral decision-making here uh, in the Ocean View School District because, um, and frankly, it's, it's not, uh, it's rather uncivil, number one. It's not good for working conditions and morale, and, and also it's illegal. We cannot do that. Dr. Hansen? I, I, you know, there's something else that we haven't considered. Um, if, if we make a change in every day, we're going to need parents to have a uh, time to uh, tell them the new schedule and give them time to change their child care plans. Uh, because as we've heard, there's many parents that work. Um, we, uh, we, need to, uh, we need to give them forewarning so they can make changes. Um, also, our, um, our, our own child care, if we go to an every day, we are probably going to have to change our own child care program and make changes there, um, which could be advantageous to, to parents. Um, and so there, there's a lot of moving parts. There's also transportation that needs, that needs to be changed, um, the custodial schedules. Um, uh, there's a lot of things that are going to need to be changed that are going to take some effort. Yeah. So we're just talking about right now, everything we've talked about is negotiating with um, the teachers. We also have to negotiate with the classified staff because mm -hmm. our classified staff has been extremely flexible and have changed their schedules to accommodate this current schedule. Uh, if we change whatever the schedule is, we're going to have to change their schedules again. And that, that takes some time for communication. Yes, of course. And I think that uh, at least, I think several of us had, did mention the classified staff and the fact that we have multiple labor groups, not just the teachers that have to be taken into consideration. Our, our esteemed classified staff have a collective bargaining agreements as well. And we have to work with them because without them, frankly, our, um, our institution can't function. In, in fact, I think it's per the ed code or the government code, if they're not at school, the teachers can't be at school legally. Like we need them here because they do such, they have their function, their work functions are so critical that they have to be on campus for us to be able, for the teachers, I should say, to be on campus. So, uh, yes, Trustee Westwood, you're recognizing me. recognizing me. I'm a little bit unclear. I understand the board is sending you into labor negotiations, but I'm unclear what the board is directing you to negotiate. Can you please tell the board what you'll be negotiating when you go to visit our labor group? We're looking at a revised schedule of students on campus. That what you're looking for is that students come to school more than two days a week, preferably four or five. So that's a dip, that's a change in schedule and that there's a total number of increased hours of in-person instruction from what the schedule we have now. Do you have a total hours that we're going to be in I, I, I have not heard that direction, and I, I, uh, I would prefer that we, uh, what, what we use, what we're using right now is the number of minutes that are required for students to have instruction, which is, like, for example, for a first through, um, I don't know off the top of my head, first through fifth is 240 minutes, for example, I'll use those instructional minutes as a guide. And, and I'm concerned about that. Trustee That's Westwell, good. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Our, our administrative assistant says she cannot hear you. They can't hear you. You, don't, you, need, you, to don't, hear you. you need to turn your mic on, possibly. Get closer to it. He wasn't on before. No, really Go ahead, Trustee Westlaw. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm a little unclear because we're going in. It's, it's very unusual for all my years that I've been on the board. It's unusual to send someone into the negotiation with our labor without the board directing the specific things to be negotiated. I'm concerned that we're saying, hey, go out and negotiate something. And let us know. That's not how negotiation works. 
what they're decreasing in a minute. There's no specified number for it. And I heard four or five days, we're going to increase to four or five days. It's really kind of ambiguous. And that's concerning to me as a board member because the board is supposed to give direction on what the superintendent is supposed to do. I'm just very concerned about it, and I'm surprised the rest of the board is not concerned as well. Thank you. Trustee Westwell, what I'm concerned about is that you're lacking the memory of what we normally do. Actually, what you said is the exact opposite of what we normally do. Typically, we go into closed session and we hear from our chief negotiator, Mr. Avila, and from our superintendent and from our deputy superintendent and our other assistant superintendent about what they think is best. They bring us information. We give them parameters of things that we can frankly tolerate or things we'd like to them to work on. But actually, it's the exact opposite of what you said. The exact opposite. I cannot go into exactly what we say in closed session. I would not violate the Brown Act of doing that, but I can give you a hypothetical. Uh, we go into closed session. We hear from our chief negotiator, Mr. Avila, who presents information about what he's been talking to classified staff and teachers about. And then he says, I need some direction about the things that I've been talking about with them already. And we say yes, or we say no. And then he goes back and talks to them. And this might go back and forth, maybe even if it's gone on sometimes as short as four or five times to 25 times. I remember when I was first elected, the school board frankly was broken. And the teachers were talking about unilateral striking and things like that. Because you have to, in good faith, bargain. And that process occurs when the exact opposite of what you said goes on. I saw Trustee Souders nodding his head. I saw Trustee Singer nodding her head. And of course, Trustee Briscoe knows that this is the absolute truth. I'm not sure why you're not remembering that, but we are giving our superintendent to go back and be able to talk about this. We will have a closed session at our next meeting. That's the key. And in this closed session, we can talk about the specifics of the negotiations, which we cannot do right now because we are in open session and we will not violate the law, Trustee Westwell. That's what we will not do. Thank and you. I do want to just, for, thank excuse you for that, me, President. excuse me. I had the floor. Well, actually, excuse actually, you've already spoken for five I wasn't minutes. Done. I understand that, but your time is going on. Just hold on, please. You'll be able to speak again. We've extended debate. Dr. Hansen, do you have anything to say before we go back to Trustee Westwell? I, I want to let the public know out there that the board is being extremely transparent and the board is being extremely open to the, the needs of, of parents. Um, these are typical conversations that we're having right now that really could be done behind closed doors under the auspices of, of negotiations. And I commend the board for being open with the public and letting them know that we do, but I agree with President Clayton Carvin that we do need to be cautious uh, about the extent that we're, we're speaking about negotiations. Trustee Westfall, you recognize. Yes, thank you for recognizing me again. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from what the teachers union is going to tell us what they want because that's what we're going to end up doing, no doubt. So as soon as the labor groups can tell us what they want and how they want this district to run, then the board will be able to know uh, uh, how to vote. Thank you. Okay, well, first of all, you're incorrect. That's not how it works. The teachers do not run this school district, sir. The board of trustees, along with the administration as a governance team does but we work in cooperation with the teachers and the staff. We have two labor groups. We have OVTA and we have CSEA, Chapter 375. And as much as you don't like it, labor has rights. You can stamp your feet, you can get angry, you can be upset. I could be upset, I could stamp my feet. I could say I don't like it. And frankly, sometimes I don't, but that doesn't mean that I don't follow the law. We will follow the law. 
I'm not going to talk any more about what we're going to talk about in closed session because I'm not going to violate the Brown Act. We can't talk about negotiations from the dais. It's a violation of the law. And in fact, Trustee Westwell, you have been accused and charged of doing that. And the Teachers Association has brought a complaint against you and a legal charge against you in the past because you did that. And we had to negotiate with them and settle the case. I was the president at the time when I settled the case for you because of your indiscretions. I please ask you, sir, to stop. We're not going to talk about specifics of negotiations at all anymore from this dais. Madam Vice President, do you have anything to say? No, I, I just have to say that I, I take offense to what I just heard. I feel like we have such great relationship because of the Pell um, system that we have in place with our labor groups. And we I am so proud of our teachers' willingness to come back because they knew it was the best thing possible for our kids. And so I am confident that they will do the right thing by our students they are to be commended because we are the one of the first districts that went back into in-person teaching. And that is because of the amazing working relationship we have with those teachers. And I, again, I am very proud of those relationships. And I think that that is what has allowed us to be successful in this process. And I think the parents have seen the night and day difference between great working relationship and not so. I can tell you as a parent, my child in the high school district, their board meetings, not public. I cannot see what's happening. I have no idea what is happening behind them, the decisions that are making. My child returned to school this week for the first time. No pet plexiglass was purchased. There are no temperature checks being done yet. High schoolers, as we all know, are in a higher critical time for them. They could actually get really sick because their age group is at a higher risk. And so I, again, I commend us and I commend the staff, our administration, our teachers, our classified staff for the amazing work that they have done. And this is because of the great working relationship. And I, I could not be more proud. But the things I hear from the community is, thank you for being transparent. Thank you for being honest about what you guys are doing. If the high school district would have done what you did, our kids could have returned. And instead, 60% of their teachers did not return. We have substitute teachers babysitting our high school kids as they are being taught virtually because the teachers did not feel safe. And I do not, I understand it. I, as a teacher, I, I would, I can't dispute them not feeling safe. If there were no plexiglasses purchased for them, no PPE, no nothing. I, I understand their fears and their concerns. So again, I commend us for the hard work we've done. We've made some tough decisions, but I also know that, again, it is because of the hard work of this administration, the teachers, and all of the labor groups that we have come so far. So I know we are, we're going to do the right thing for our students, and I look forward to seeing what that looks like. Thank you, Madam Vice President. And I concur as a person that has a child in the high school district as well, and I can tell you they're upside down. And Dr. Hansen, you have led a team that is right side up and doing absolutely tremendous work. Thank you. I know that it's not gonna please everybody all of the time. I know that we're gonna have some folks that are unhappy with what we're doing. And I understand, and I understand how they feel. And um, we're all in a really hard situation, but the guarantee that I can give the community as the current president of the Board of Trustees, is that we want to make it better. We recognize that it may not be serving all of you the way that you'd like it to be serving you and your children, and that we know that we must make changes. We're not perfect, but we're together, and we're going to move forward in a productive manner, we're going to stay calm, stay calm, and we're going to do what's best for our children. The kids are counting on us, and they're watching us, and they're listening to us at home, in the classroom, when we walk in the street. They're listening to input from the TV, 
and the radio and the internet. I encourage all of you parents that are listening to take care of your children and understand that they're under tremendous stress. And when you're under stress, they're under stress because you are their lifeline. I'd like to move now to be able to adjourn. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. I've heard a, a motion. Second. And I did hear your second, Madam Vice President. Thank you. Uh, because there's no discussion on a motion to adjourn, I will now go to the vote. Before I do that, I just want to tell the community that Dr. Hansen will communicate with you um, in writing uh, with a recap and next steps. Is that correct, Dr. Hansen? Correct. Thank you. Trustee Briscoe, how do you vote? Aye. Trustee Singer? Aye. Trustee Souders? Aye. Trustee Westwell? Aye. And I'm a yes. We are a 5-0 to adjourn. And it is now 742. I am going to now adjourn this meeting of the Ocean View School District.